there are, in, there are inherently too many rules. I believe there are inherently too many laws. Like I've joked on podcasts before that my dream business partner is Elon Musk. What's that Daniel I, Defense I, dude's name? Where do you hey, 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 <laughs> hey. <laughs> Welcome to Oil & Whiskey, an Ironclad original. Today's guest is Mike Mahalski, owner of Sons of Liberty Gunworks in San Antonio, which provides hard, high-quality, hard-use blasters by Patriots for Patriots. You can check out his work on Sons of Liberty GW on Instagram. Mike, welcome to Oil & Whiskey. Welcome. Welcome, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, so how fucking hot is it in San Antonio right now? Today, uh, it's probably in the 90s, which feels mild because come June, man, I mean, you're, you're in the hundreds and it's, it's miserable. I mean, you can't, you can't walk to your truck without just fucking feeling it. Yeah, we got that going on here right now. Got yeah, ourselves a little heat wave. It's in the 90s through. for us, which is, you know, north of Chicago, 90s are, that's a heat wave. We were in Austin <laughs> last year around, what, July? We were in Austin. Oh, fuck. I, yeah, I don't remember. It's it brutal. Fuck. Yeah, that was like 8 yeah, o'clock it, in the morning hot. 9 o'clock at night was fucking hot. Yeah, it's it's oppressively hot. I mean, when, when you go like to San Diego or Denver or some of these cities, you look around, it seems like people are more fit. Probably because they <laughs> you want to be outside being active. Like here, you just, you just want to find some AC and not do shit. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of like Chicago. We just want to find the heat. You know? Yeah. Fuck, you see that, like, you go to Houston, you see those, like, rancher dudes. Like, you know, they're wearing those thick ass, like, yeah. I, I don't even know who makes them, but they're rancher shirts they're out in the way more of a, degrees. Way more of a man, man than yeah. we are. Uh, well, I know that this is going to be repetitive for you uh, in some regards because you've probably told your origin story and the story about uh, Sons of Liberty Gunworks a hundred fucking times. But. We're an automotive-based podcast that also talks about some guns, talks about whiskey and other kind of cool shit. So on a, on a more condensed version to at least give our listeners some background of, of how where the fuck you came from and where the fuck this badass brand came from. Because we're, we're fans. I love everything about the brand and specifically you because you seemingly tell it like it is. And that's refreshing to see in, in any marketplace. I'm, I'm assuming you must be born, raised in either... California or New York, because you seem very left leaning based on your <laughs> your Instagram. I've, I've poked around there a little bit. Yeah, no, oh, so bo- yeah, <laughs> bo- uh, born and raised in San Antonio, Texas. Um, so, like, I've I've always been just guns were a passion of mine since I was as old as I can remember. I have a I have a three year old and a five year old, and I watched my three year old and the, my five year old. They're they're like hyper into dinosaurs or hyper into you know legos or something right it's all they do it's all it consumes them that's how i was with guns even at that age you know toy guns whatever and uh it just it was the one, it was the one constant kind of in my life throughout my whole you know child i grew up you know on uh like farms and ranches of course you know shooting and hunting you, you really learned the the practical necessity of a good rifle you know and i remember being a kid you know when i was very young and, and when you're when you're that young, you're walking through the woods at night with your dad or something. It is entirely possible for there to be a lion or a bear behind every bush. When you're five, you know that's that's a that's a reality, right? Yeah. You know? <laughs> and you know, I would tell my dad, I'm you know that I was scared, and, and he would tell me, "Well, if you have a good rifle, you're the most dangerous thing in the woods." And it just it just stuck with me. Um, and so I saw the practical necessity for it. So I started I started building guns. Uh, I, I, Every I owned every type of rifle you could imagine, and there was always something that you know I I think could have been done a little bit better. I really liked what these guys did with this, but I think they could have done something over here. And you just start looking at things you'd have done. So I started building guns in my garage, and uh, after after a couple of months of that, I got a visit from the ATF. <laughs> Well, and they're sure like good then huh you're, <laughs> no, yeah you're i selling. think i had shipped like <laughs> i think i had shipped like 40 guns to the the state of alaska or something like in a month or whatever yeah it was were you assembling or were you were you gunsmithing 
No, I was I was assembling. I mean, I was, you know, but that's that's something we can get into as to what that actually means, though, because, you know, people have a, a very weird <laughs> misconception of what that means. Like you're taking something, and you're rebranding it. Uh, we can talk about that here a little bit. But we'll get to it. Yeah. The, yeah. But as far as the uh, how, how it started, the ATF paid me a visit. And by the way, if anybody thinks that there's not a gun registry, that is complete bullshit. OK, because when they sat me down. They had a they had a list of every gun I had ever purchased in my entire life, okay. And like, so if you don't think there's a registry, that's not true. And they basically said, "Hey, this is your warning. Uh, you know, you need to, go, you need to get a license." And you didn't, they have, took any, a you guy. didn't have any dogs at that time, did you? <laughs> fortunately, fortunately <laughs> not. And, and I also realized that when the when the ATF asks you a question, they they typically already know the answer, right? So. Uh, Anyways, they took a guy who was kind of fucking around in his garage and doing it as more more so as a hobby. I started building guns for team guys and Marines. Those are my buddies. Those are my clients. They were buddies of mine that were, you know, I knew from when I used to live in San Diego or friends of my brother. And that was it. So they because of that, I left the garage, started Sons of Liberty Gunworks, and now we arm tens of thousands of Americans across the country. I, sometimes I wonder if they would have just they should just let me keep fucking around in the garage. You know? <laughs> how uh, how helpful were they in the process of like, all right, this is your warning. Now, if you want to do it legit, this is the steps you need to go through. Or are they just like, quit fucking around. You better you better figure it out. No, you you better figure it out. I mean, they're not in the business of helping you know, people stand up weapons manufacturing. I will say this: in, in all fairness, the uh, yeah, they they weren't the. Uh, they weren't like total pricks. They actually, these guys, they seemed like they were halfway decent dudes. Um, you know, I was clearly operating in some pretty gray area and, you know, it was their job to, that, I mean, that is what they do, right? Their profession is to regulate the, you know, manufacture and interstate commerce of, of firearms trade, right? So I can't say they were pricks about it, although, you know, all in all, I, I believe the ATF is quite hostile to the industry in which they regulate, but those two guys weren't, you know. Interesting. When you we'll get into more of it, but you talked about uh, as a kid, you're just so hyper focused on on guns, and specifically for something your father said. I want to ask you did Did you draw guns as a kid? And, <laughs> very okay, so very poorly. <laughs> I, I had a buddy in in school, middle school too. I was I was probably uh, ten, maybe nine, ten, eleven, something like that. And I remember we were very big into drawing like side profiles of, of guns and then all of the different attachments and stuff. Obviously some of this, we were, you we were bending reality on, on some of this stuff as a 10 year old, like you laser guns and ray and guns. And How, laser. Yeah. I mean, all kinds of different, like, you know, what specifically back then was like taking like some saws, you know, or, you know, some, <laughs> some M 16 style stuff and then just modernizing that. But then attachment upon attachment, and almost kind of like a configurator of like starting and then all. But let me tell you something about how uncool that is for two kids to be like trading pictures of guns at like 10 or 11 years old. You, you get some looks. Did you have like the super bad lunchbox you know, treasure trove of guns? I had, had, a, had a, yeah. a binder, had a Trevor. Yeah, I'll tell you a big, big <laughs> glorious veiny one. Dude. You, know, you drew something different. Well, you want to talk about making some trades. Dude. I, I was probably about the same age. I traded a fucking BB gun pistol in the back of the bus to Mike Dunn for a stack of Playboys. His dad was a, a porno <laughs> photographer. Really? And this kid would distribute. He'd tuck him inside his trapper keeper, like yeah. in the... You know the shell of it, and that was it. Like that was a, a hiding spot. Little yeah. CO2 powered BB gun pistol scored me a Changed stack of playboys. Yes, <laughs> look where I'm at today. You know, <laughs> bartering. Uh, so, so you you you've you going legit, right? So you've got to do your thing. You're doing this on your own. You've got a backer. You got a partner. How? The, I mean, you can't just go out and be like. That looks like a good storefront. Let me get some fucking employees. No, man, because at, at that point in my life, man, that was probably the lowest period of my life. Like, what, what's funny is the garage that I was working in uh, not long after my visit got taken, uh, taken away. <laughs> you know, I was, uh, I was you know, living with a girl, came home, uh, put the, the key in the lock, locked in, locked in, turned, dude. And uh, I mean, I had I had nothing, you know, and that's, I think that's part of why the company was able to launch because there was no backup plan. There was nothing, you know? And I mean, you know, I had nothing but 
time and energy to pour into something. And we, we, we had no money. So my, I, my, I have a very, uh, I have a business partner, a very cool guy. We've been together since day one of sons. He had a, uh, he had like a, an unused basement on a lumber yard that his family owned and, you know, maybe a thousand square foot or something. And we didn't have to pay rent. And I sold my car at the time. And after I'd paid off a couple of buddies that I'd owed some money to, uh, I had like seven thousand dollars, and that was the that was the start of Sons Liberty. Was seven thousand dollars in my buddy's uh, basement in a lumberyard, and that was that was not even ten years ago. You know, uh, it, I mean, it feel it feels like a long time ago, but if you think about it, like the grand scheme of things, it just it, it wasn't. And we started off like bootstrapping, and if I mean the truth is, if I didn't sell a gun that that day or that week or something like that. I mean, there was a real chance I wasn't going to eat. Um, and, and back then there's a, there's no way that I could, that that story could happen if, if I tried it today, there's just no way back then on social media, you could get on there and talk about guns freely. Uh, if you develop a bit of a fall, all I had was a cell phone camera and a sense of humor. And we were able to develop a bit of a following. And I have always been pretty good at being able to explain the technical function of these weapons and why this feel is better and why this, you know, I've always been able to explain the mechanical operation of the weapon really well. And uh, organically, I was we were able to create a small following, which turned into a, uh, a pretty big following. That never could have happened today, though. I mean, we're, we're so heavily throttled and, and, and just messed up on, on social media that, like, you couldn't get it off the ground, you know. What? And anyway, that's how we started. Those you know, sense of humor, cell phone, seven grand in a basement. Dude. <laughs> that's, I mean, it's amazing. We we have you know hundreds of these episodes, and we talk about the you know the, this the kicking off and the origin story or whatever it is. I'm so amazed, and it always comes down, like you said, it's the it's kind of the grit, but the grit out of necessity of like like you said, no backup plan, and the fact of like I ain't got no option. There, the failure isn't an option, right? And that's easy to say, but when failure really isn't an option, it's amazing what you can do when you're, well, I, I, yeah, I, mean, I graduated dead last in my high school class, never went to college. Like I, the first job I ever had in my whole life was Sons of Liberty before then I was, you know, I was working for bookies and, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, like that, that was, uh, yeah, that was my, my background, you know, it was not engineering or metallurgy. I just, once you get, once you, I think once you devote a certain amount of time thousands and thousands of hours of study in the particular thing i mean you you know you you develop some level of actual expertise you know through self-study you get a backup plan through all that are you like looking on craigslist thinking like well shit i could grab this job and have a you know maybe get some benefits get a check coming in every week or are you just man my personality you're, you're just gonna fucking make it yeah my personality didn't lend to that man i mean i you know I, I've, I've had a, a problem with authority, you could say, and, and, I, I, and I, I, and I, and I still do, except for now, I consider Bank of America, you know, the authority, I, you know, uh, because they won't, they won't let me have an account, uh, you know, I, yeah, I, so I, I still have a problem with authority. I've just channeled it in a way that I think is, you know, a bit more productive, uh, or at least making, I think, making a bit of a difference. You know, uh, last year we had. You know, 43 saves, meaning our rifles were used in 43 incidents of justified self-defense. Uh, and I sleep just fine knowing that, you know. It'd be amazing to see if the uh, major news operations would put out those 43 different saves uh, a year. You didn't, and you didn't see that? Their, uh, I didn't see that. No, it would. I think it's it not would, their narrative. It would change the narrative. It, it's amazing how what news you decide to... Hey, what do you think? What generates that problem with authority? Like, young age. What is there something that stands out? Was it like a gym teacher? Was it was it something that you're like, fuck that? A rebel, a rebel fucker. born with rebellion. Or that was just it. That's is just it. Because for me, it was probably a fucking gym teacher, gym teacher, music <laughs> but teacher. But you were you're, born. But you were born. A bit I wasn't here. a rebel. You were so. born with that rebellious nature, Ed, just like every child is. I suppose it's either fostered or it's or it's it's not. Yeah, yeah I mean. I just, uh, I never, I never felt the rules applied, you know, or, or I always felt the rules were a bit fucking arbitrary, you know, like, you know, I, it, it, 
So, you know, I'm not talking about like the big rules, you know, like murder and stealing and stuff like yeah. that. But when you when you walk up to an event and there's you know, like those ropes that you know, yet they route you through the crowd. You know, they they, they how they manage crowds. Yep. Or you could well, go you under. Up, or you or you could go under. And excuse if there's me, sir. nobody, excuse me, excuse me, yeah, sir. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and if there's nobody there, you know, like go, going under makes sense. Or you know, you pull up to a stoplight at two in the morning and you can see a mile in each direction. You know, that, like. That's a suggestion, dude. You know, it's a suggestion this yeah. morning. We were in a hurry. Fuck this. No, I, so, I mean, yeah, that, that, that was, I mean, I think that's just kind of wired in and that's, that was it. I think it's, it's definitely, like you said, it's, you clarified it by not that the rules didn't apply. The rules are suggestions in certain situations where right. if it's not going to hurt anybody else and I'm not, I'm not cutting in line. I'm just being more efficient on, on getting through the line. Right. So you're not saying the rules don't apply to you. That's a, that's, there is people that feel that that's a little more narcissistic. That's a little bit more of like, I'm, I'm smarter than everybody else. I don't yeah, think that's what no, you're saying. It's, it's more not at all. We, Cause we do it all the time. We look at, especially TSA. It's, it's a common sense. And you look yeah. at the routing yeah. and you're like, man, this, this seems stupid. Like this could be better. So I'm going to make this more efficient for everybody. Yeah, and that's and that's exactly that's precisely like I said. I mean, you know, running a stoplight at you know five p.m. rush hour traffic is considerably different than you're arbitrarily stopped there because you know you're not. I use that example a lot because the purpose of a stoplight, you know, it's a legitimate safety feature for you know rush hour traffic. Or at two o'clock in the morning, it's it's just a real. It's inconvenience and a pain in the ass. It's, it's just because it's on a timer. It's, it's the only reason it's there is it's on a timer. Well, but I mean, but if you look at a lot of society, if you look at a lot, of, I I believe there are in, there are inherently too many rules. I believe there are inherently too many laws. Um, I don't think this is the founders' intent. You know, I mean, like, you know, there are there are big natural laws. You know, that I think are you know, universal, whether it's from the Ten Commandments or just from any function in society. But then. Go, go try to articulate the fucking tax code to somebody, you know, or, you know, there's a book out there. It's called three felonies a day. And, you know, the average American, I mean, you know, you, you take an apple across state lines, you could be in violation of some interstate commerce law or something. And so when I say I have a problem with authority, I have a problem with arbitrary laws that are kind of set into, into opposition that, you know, that that's, that's probably the, a better way to put it. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. But, Fucking spot on, man. I probably know your answer, and this is going to get me riled up. This is this one that I I take. This is coming back to airports somehow. Right? No, it's coming back to seatbelts. Okay. It's what do you what do you what is your take on you in your vehicle by yourself and a law having to tell you that you better buckle up or you get a ticket for it? Yeah, I mean that again. Seat seatbelts, um, certain hel- you know helmet laws. Um, in the fact that your seatbelt violation doubles in a school zone. So like, you know, the fact that that ticket is double in a school, you're not endangering anybody. If you don't have a seatbelt on the driving the speed limit, got both hands on the wheel, you're, right. you know, you're sober, you're, you're, you know, you're doing well, but yes, it's, th- it's stuff like that. Now I have heard the counter arguments to that, you know, I've talked to buddies of mine that are surgeons and they say, well, it's a drain on the medical resources when they have to you know patch you back together from going through the, the windshield or, you know, perhaps if you have a minor in the back seat, well, perhaps they should have a car seat or a seat belt, you know, but, but if you, that. yeah, but you, but you with your own adult consenting life, you know, the state, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm a car junkie. I don't know if you need that. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty into car. So that's why when y'all invited me, I was, I was really, really oh, stoked. Yeah, sweet. But so I have a, I have a, a 2023 uh, 911 Turbo S, and I and I had it, really? you know, I got the whole stealth deal and the, you know, blacked out the windows. It's real, it looks like the, the Batmobile. I was at a, uh, I was at a, a, a pharmacy. I was picking up some medicine for my kids, and a guy walked in uh, ahead of me, loaded up all of the wine and beer he could carry in his arms, and just walked out the front door. And I asked the cashier, like, do you want me to go out there and drag that fucker back in here? That won't be a problem whatsoever. <laughs> and the cashier's like, no, no, it's not a big deal. Like, he does this all the time. Like, he's a regular, you know, this is a thing. Jeez. Well, 
okay, I pay for my 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 prescriptions and I get in my car and three blocks down the road I get pulled over and I get a three hundred dollar ticket for my window tint. <laughs> oh yeah, that and doesn't, so, uh, that that doesn't sit fucking so, well. well so, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, I you know you voice that. So, I, so I, yeah, we'll sign the ticket and I you know go. <laughs> you know, actually, I, it was more. But the the point is, is that here's a crime where there's actually a victim. You know, all of us are the victim, right? Because they have to price in that loss right. to all their products. The products are more expensive because assholes like this. And he walks out. No one's going to call the cops on him. He's not in any trouble whatsoever. Me, I'm a productive member of society. I pay my taxes. I certainly don't steal shit from stores. And I'm paying a three hundred dollar fine because my window tint is too dark. And that's the kind of conflict that I have with just the the absurdity of some of this stuff, you know? Fucking nuts. Uh, <laughs> right? Yeah, we, I, I, can, I can see my, I can feel this my blood a, pressure getting it, up. It's a podcast in itself. Yeah, it is. This is it's 100%. It's fucking <laughs> sheer <laughs> stupidity. This stuff just drives me fucking Especially crazy. when he starts talking about, like, the counter-argument to the seatbelt law was it's a drain on society yeah, and the resources. I, I, I mean, I, like I suppose I could understand but, that. I, well, there's a there's a point to be made there. How many, how many fucking assholes go out there and wreck shit because they're drinking, right? So drinking is a, is a, is a, would be a... I would argue that McDonald's is a hell of a lot bigger drain on yeah. medical resources. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I would argue that Pepsi Cola is a hell of a lot bigger drain. Yeah, on, they're not. They're not. But no one's fucking find worried for, about us. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, right. but they're yeah they're not going to find you for drinking a Pepsi and eating a fucking Big Mac, dude. But they will find you for that seatbelt. Yeah. You know, when you when you got seven thousand dollars in your bank account and you've got your uh, your buddy's uh, basement right and you're you're ready and rocking, how how far out is your outlook? Is that in 90 days, I want to be here. In the end of the year, I want to be here. Where, where are you looking for the future? And then I want to get into kind of what's the first thing. Is it buying stock, inventory? At that point, you're assembling, and then we'll get into the assembling versus Smith, all that kind of stuff. He's working yeah. in a basement. It's probably like, I want to make sure I can turn dinner. the lights on tomorrow and yeah. eat tonight. Well, probably. Yeah. But you, everybody's got a little bit of a, man, it sure would be nice to get to this point. Sure. So, I mean, I had I had ideas of grandeur. I mean, I wanted to be the best rifle company in the country, and I honestly believed that we could. There was a time I we went to SHOT Show our very first year, and at this point, I had, for my company, we had built probably less than 50 or 60 guns total ever at, from Sons of Liberty, I'm saying, like, as a licensed entity. And I'm in the elevator uh, riding down the elevator at the Venetian, and the guy gets on, it's Marty Daniel. He owns Daniel Defense, which is probably like the pinnacle of a privately owned right. gun company, right? I mean, these guys are making 60,000 rifles a year. And I took his hand and I said, man, you know, I'm a big fan of your work. Uh, it's really it's really a pleasure to meet you. And he said, it's it's always nice to meet a, a customer. <laughs> I said, no, no, I'm a competitor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a competitor, you know? And I, I, I mean, some asshole built 50 guns in his basement, you know? Um <laughs> So, I mean, I had ideas of grandeur. I, I thought that, and I never had any confidence issues. We would go to, like, to these trade shows, and we had a wrinkly tablecloth and a few rifles on the table, and I was sitting next to a booth that cost $2 million. Uh, you know, just a booth is what, it, you know, it cost. But it, I, I, I never felt necessarily like the underdog. I felt like, you know, our product was legitimately better. I could explain the product better. And I'm the captain of my own fate. You know, you're you're a guy who reads a fucking brochure, for a living, I, I wrote my brochure, and and that was just my mentality. But to ask what the plan was, yeah, the plan was I hope I could get some beer and a cheeseburger tonight. <laughs> you know, that that was the goal. And and I honestly had no idea what busy looked like. I mean, you know, I I would fantasize about you know selling fifty rifles or a hundred rifles or you know something like. That. I never pictured. I guess the logistics of what that looks like when whenever we have forklifts in our shop loading flatbeds, I didn't picture that. I knew I wanted to be a, a big rifle company, but you don't picture the details of what that looks like. You know, we need forklifts now. You know, so uh, but no, there was no plan. I mean, the, the plan was simply to just keep getting the word out, and it. And the other, the other thing too is you you can't tell. You can't when you're looking forward, you can't tell how far you've come. It feels like you're in quicksand. You know, it doesn't feel like you're moving at all. It's not until you turn around and look backwards and you see how far you've come. But when you're looking ahead, dude, and you're pulling that plow, it doesn't feel like you moved at all. 
Um, until this day, I, I still feel like I'm in quicksand. It's not until you turn around and I look through old pictures of where we were, where I was still driving orders to the post office to ship and stuff like that. Like it's not until you look in hindsight and see, man, we, we've, yeah, we've, we've come a long way. That is one of the best ways I've ever heard it put. It really we've is. talked, we've talked around that subject all the time. You know, you, you never wish somebody would tell us it's the good old days, you know, when it was the good old days, you know, and that is, you know, very well put on because you're so, you're so bogged down in the day to day, right? You don't see the problems that you solve and it, you have to look back and like, holy fuck. Remember when we were doing that shit? Yeah. At least we're not doing that anymore. You know, how important was yeah. going through all that stuff to building the business and knowing every aspect of it? Yeah, it, it's, in, it's incredibly important. Uh, first of all, it, it, it keeps you humble and, and it also keeps you lean. You know, uh, we didn't have any money to blow. Like we didn't have like a, a marketing budget at all. Like, so the, the, the marketing again was a cell phone and a sense of humor. And you don't take your, you take your work very seriously, but you learn not to take yourself very seriously. And I think being able to like, you know, make fun of myself and, you know, kind of just mixing humor with information. Like, you know, metallurgy is a boring subject. You know, if you're trying to talk, talk, talk to somebody about like, uh, you know, the, the sheer strength of uh, something, that that's not very fun, but you mix it in with some humor uh, and it's palatable. And, and I think that made us also relatable because I mean, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm every asshole in town. I'm, I'm, I'm the, the most regular guy in the world. It just happens to you know, be pretty good at, at guns. And I, that made us relatable. And I think that, that helped. I mean, there was, I look at rifle companies today, a lot of our competitors, and uh, it's very sterile. And it's a, it's a company. And it's a faceless entity. And like, I, I, I wonder if, they, if we were able to, I guess, create some type of almost cultural phenom for if somebody wants to make a statement today about what their position is on guns, they do it wearing a Sons of Liberty t-shirt. Yeah. Like, I think it's really cool to see Rogan wearing one of our shirts or Tulsi Gabbard's going to make a statement who, about her position on guns. Joseph. <laughs> Joe, I haven't heard. Is he, he's somebody famous or something? There's a podcast. Like really? Is it any good? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, that that's that's pretty neat. I don't think you can I don't think you can buy that. No. You can't go out and purchase that. You know, I mean, like there's a level of authenticity and then you know but that's relatability the, that, and that's the brand that's the brand building and the and the and the reality of you just being a real dude, right? That I yeah. that's fucking awesome. It but that that's where it's at now because you've backed it up with fucking products, right? So it's not, you can't just be the fucking guy. You can be the guy for a while. You can be the guy yeah. that has, that's, that's yeah. silver tongued and it's fucking funny and has a brand and everybody wants to have it. But sooner or later when your shit sucks, right? Yeah. That, that fades away. So at the beginning, you're buying, or this is what, 2012, 2013, 2014? 2014, yeah. Are you, so you buying forgings then or you, did you start out, you know, machining your lowers or what? No, man. So we, at the time when we very first started, we had to, uh, we had to work with companies who were willing to work with us. Like there was a, there was a specific bolt. There was a bolt that I wanted to use that legitimately met all of the criteria and the criteria for a bolt, which is the heart of the gun, right? Every single step of the cycle of operation involves that bolt. And, uh, there was only one that really met all of the specifications. Is that and three initials? Long... Is that three initials for that company? Uh, no, 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 no. So there, there was a no, but but anyways, but their minimum order quantity to order that bolt in the configuration that I wanted that went through all of the individual high pressure testing and was you know the right material and the right shop peening and blah blah blah, right heat treat. Uh, there was a 500 piece minimum order. Well, dude, I mean, I didn't have the money to do that. And I called and I bugged their VP for 30 days in a row. I would call him and the guy finally, like on the 30th day said, listen, he's like, if I sell you some bolts, will you promise to only contact me by email? 
<laughs> and I was like, you have my word. <laughs> and he's like, all right, how many do you think you want? Yeah, that is a restraining order. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He was like, he's like, how many do you want? I told him 10. 10. And that's what we, now, I mean, we know we go through thousands and thousands a month and they're still our OEM. But like to get into the difference between that is, yeah, when you're very first starting out, you're you're trying to select the component, something a spring. You're trying to find the spring that has all of the properties you want, all all of it, whether it's corrosion resistance or whether it's, um, you know, uh, compression decompression cycle life or whatever you're looking for, right? And you're you're hyper specific because it has a real function. This isn't arbitrary. Nothing on that thing is arbitrary. It's a real. It has a real function, and some stuff is better than others. Yeah, that's the truth. Then as you grow and you start, you're able to start buying things in, in volume of tens of thousands, you know, and that's your, that's your repeating orders. Ten, then you go in there with your own engineering drawing. You go in there with your own prints. You have your own specifications. You've made uh, proprietary changes to things. So there's this misconception in the gun industry that unless you manufacture something under your own roof, then you're just an assembler. Well, no, if that was the case, then why do we have fucking intellectual property attorney? You know, why, you know, it, we're doing stuff that's so novel right now that we're looking into, you know, creators with the military and stuff, right? Because you're, you're at some point, there's nothing commercially available that's going to achieve what you need it to achieve for your own performance metric. And you're having to invent it. Like I have, like I've joked on podcasts before that my dream business partner is Elon Musk. Not not so much for the capital. Yeah, sure, having the richest guy in the world as your business partner wouldn't hurt. But the access to the material science, it's like gun, the gun industry is 30 years behind, okay, like every other industry in terms of material science. That's because there's no giant concentration of wealth in the gun industry. There's just not. You know, a, a large weapons contract with the military might be a few tens of millions of dollars, which is, you know, not chump change, but it's also not quite the same as like, I don't know, SpaceX, you know, and whenever you're starting to having to really pursue material sciences because you're having to get mass into orbit and then that mass has to survive reentry, right? Like, that's the stuff that's neat. And I think people kind of are a little bit lost on how this stuff works. I, I, I go borrow aerospace technology as often as I can. Um, additive manufacturing, like that's something that's that, you know, evolved through aerospace and the medical and surgical stuff, man. But like, we're absolutely taking advantage of in the in the weapon side. I mean, the next few years for guns are going to be pretty exciting uh, because we've made a leap. What are you chasing? Are you chasing like precision, longevity? Like, it seems like there's enough technology out of there that you could grab, you know, a high-end weapon and make it do most of the, if not everything you'd want it to do. I mean, wh wh where are you falling short that you think the materials aren't there, or the the budgets? That's not a, there? Yeah, that, that's a that's a really great question. I mean, because for the most part, people you don't know what you don't know, right? But let's just say hypothetically, somebody were to come to you and say, um, "We want to defeat this armor." Now, like you know, or hey, if you get into a near peer war. The next war we get into, we might not be shooting dudes in robes in a cave. You know, you might be shooting Russians or the Chinese, and they're wearing level four plates. Okay, and here's the rifle that you're issued, and it shoots a bullet. And you have to accelerate that mass to a certain velocity with a certain, you know, density and in, in, in projectile design to defeat, you know, armor. Okay, well, at some point with the current materials, you start running out of physics. Like, you know, you're talking about, you know, pressures that have never been attempted or successfully achieved uh in the longevity of the parts to be able to handle those higher pressures and then when you're talking about different bullet construction barrels having to survive that velocity with that material and it's non-compressible and so on and so forth now when you get into stuff like that yeah like the the average casual gun owner that that is be way beyond what they may need or if you're a deer hunter a certain i mean you know Certainly, certainly probably not what you need to bring down uh you know a deer but uh but ivan you want to shoot fucking ivan 
Well, you know, <laughs> you have to. You might have to get some hotter shit. Are we talking and, about Ivan Drago that, here. We've <laughs> yeah, and nice ju- that, that juiced up Siberian. Yeah, still but, kicking, man. Kick <laughs> but, but I mean, but the thing about it, that, so you, when you're starting to look at the increasing lethality of the platform, that's where you're or, le- or increasing the lethality of the operator. It's not just about what that bullet does when it hits a target, but it's also the the ability for the bullet to hit the target. So you're looking at flatter trajectories, you're looking at more velocity, you're looking at pushing more mass, you're looking at, you know, all of these things, longer lifespans or, or being able to have longer service life in certain environments, so on and so forth. That kind of stuff, like if you're on the cutting edge of that, it doesn't exist. You, you, you know, if you're some interesting, you know, unit that might have to think about those concerns, like you don't, you don't go to Cabela's. Yeah. Right. You know, that's, I that's, mean, so, that's that helps me understand it quite a bit. I mean, I'm a, I'm very entry level on this stuff. So that's, that's in like the trick. I, mean, I didn't think of that. The trickle of down, it. the trickle down to guys like us is what is so intriguing. And that's kind of where I wanted to go with the next and ask, this is going to be a, such a convoluted way of, of asking it, but I, I oh want to, I, I think he'll understand. I, <laughs> I, Mike's a smart fucking guy. So, uh, I, I see the passion in, in what you're trying to do. And it makes, it makes sense to all of us of like, that's the thing you're trying to achieve. And that's, that's the driving of, like you said, you don't know what you don't know. So let's go find out those things. You also mentioned briefly about the, the major players, like you said, a military contract, X amount of rifles. There's guys out there that have that, that money to do those things. But I don't know if those big OEs have the same mentality. I know they don't, they don't have the same mentality as you do. It's, if that's a larger corporation and it's more profit driven and it's about like, can we shave a little bit here? I mean, obviously they want yeah. their, their weapons to work. I don't think anybody out there is like, ah, fuck it. I mean, maybe besides high point, like high point probably doesn't <laughs> give a shit, but you know, you, you know what I'm saying? There's, there's the, the companies out there that, that get some contracts and it's a good product, but I don't think they're driving the way that you're talking about, even the budget that they do have. There's a golden age of any, of any weapons company and maybe this is true for any company okay but i can i at least i can speak from my perspective there's a golden age where you're big enough to actually get the job done but you're small enough to still give a shit okay and you know we're still earning it like i'm not riding on my fucking reputation from 30 years ago I, you know 30 years ago i was collecting for a boogie <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. so you know like you know i mean i'm not you know that that's not and so when you're when you're a certain size, that's where novel things I think happen because you're willing to get creative, you're willing to be nimble, you're willing to take feedback, you're willing to incorporate feedback. I think you do get to a certain size and you become rigid. And some of the more novel stuff that you do, they're not ginormous projects. You know, uh, you know, if, if like I'm not like I'm not, I would never at, at least not where I'm currently at at my current production capacity, like I couldn't go chase, um, you know, uh, the U S army infantry or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, that's not what I would, at that point, it's logistics. If you had to, those, when you're looking at contracts like that, you're not necessarily erring on the side of performance. You're erring on the side of at least a minimum standard of performance coupled with logistics. If I want to do something truly novel, I throw fucking logistics out the window and yeah, it's going to be incredibly hard to make this part, or we're going to have to send it across the country to be coded with this and then send it to the other side of the country to be treated with that. And then blah, 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 blah. And like, you know, if I had to make a million of them, it'd be fucking tough, you know, but if, if, if that, if, if you're, if you're working on just trying to do something novel or doing something interesting like that, then I would err on performance over minimal performance coupled with logistics. And then, you know, those deals are the big on those big scale deals. Yeah. It's about how do you save a couple of, couple of dollars here, a couple of dollars there. You know, that's, I don't know what those problems are like. You know, I've, I have seen companies, I, I have seen plenty of companies that started out making a really high quality product and they were, I, I, I can, I can picture their ascent, whatever. And then they get to a certain point. Well, if I, if I save, Ten dollars a rifle, but I'm only building fifteen thousand rifles a year. That's one hundred and fifty grand. If you're building hundred thousand rifles a year. Well, that's a million bucks. That's a that's you know, a beach house. 
So I don't know, man. I may, maybe you get to a point where that you cross the threshold where you're like, fuck it. You know, <laughs> like for me, 150 grand ain't quite worth selling out just yet. I don't know if it's just selling out. I think you just get too big to move, you know, to react. That's part of it too, yeah. You, yeah. You're, you're certainly less nimble. I don't think, you, you know, yeah, you don't purposely go out and be like, fuck it. You know, but it, like you said, it, it, you get you get bogged down in the quicksand. And, and I, on the on the gun industry, this is this is broadly speaking, and I apologize in advance. This is from enthusiasts, right? Not in a manufacturer standpoint. So this would be no. this would be a car enthusiast telling us how shit's done, right? I'm looking <laughs> at it from the outside, looking at the the industry itself. It's it's unique. Um, from an enthusiast standpoint, when you go through the ranges of specifically in the last probably, I would say decade, right? Maybe maybe fifteen years on on AR specific, and you've got which was a it's a good thing for the industry in one side where you've got just such an influx of of new guys, and it's you know you've got your Gucci guns, right? And you've got all of your add-ons and your doodads and your things and your colors and your and your accessorizing the gun for the looks, right? And then you've got the the hardcore audience, right? The hardcore guys that have been in it forever or the manufacturers or whatever that know better than everybody else that put down on those guys, right? That shit's not going to work, you know. Why do you have why do you need a a a blue a anodized blue, you know, lower parts kit, you know, whatever. You're trying to justify your gold plated AK. <laughs> nobody first of all, nobody needs to yeah, justify a gold plated AK. Yeah, we're going a different that we're justifies just, itself. Yeah. Ju- but he knows what I'm talking about. And then you've got the swing, right? Back to where the which is good, I think, that the that the 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 user, right? The enthusiast, they become more they become more knowledgeable and they do their research and they start looking and they're like, all right, the thing that got me into it, right. Was the, the sex and the flash and the cool, but now I'm learning more about what the weapon system does and the parts and the components and what I need to do. Right. And what, it, what the weapon system needs to do and learn a little training along the way, but then they go all the way over to the right side. Right. And then, the, then they've got a PEC 15, you know, and then they've got all of the, quote unquote LARPing things, right? Which is the best of the best to do everything. And then they get they get shit on again because they're like, why are you gonna need that? You don't you don't need that. You don't you've never even done any training with it. So the 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 enthusiast that's got a little bit of money that wants to buy the cool shit can never fucking win because if he either buys too too fucking military or not military enough. You're damned if you do, damned if you don't. You gotta get a yeah, dude, cool that... pieces. <laughs> just get a fucking, yeah, does that, that does that make sense? No, it makes yeah, it, it, it makes perfect sense. I, it, it, to put it in terms that you'd probably appreciate, I mean, everybody that has a Sons Liberty rifle is the equivalent to someone having like a fucking thousand horsepower car, in the sense that like you know nobody's ever like we push these things to firing schedules that are insanely destructive. I mean, to handle heat and temperature that is, you know, far beyond the average. The average civilian shooter, the average civilian shooter shoots about three hundred rounds a year like the barrels that we're developing right now you know they're you know we stopped testing after 65 70 000 rounds because at a certain point it starts to become academic right i mean like you know you stop testing because like the gas tube and the action springs and the ejector springs and everything else have fucking died <laughs> by then but you know so like i mean almost everyone that has one of our guns or you know knight's armament or you know bravo company or um uh, Geisley or you know any of these per- performance brands, it you know it's almost like very very few people are ever going to take advantage of the actual nuanced difference of what that thing is. You know, of really of of and in, 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 I'm sure it's the same in cars. I know this because I've had to write the checks. Yep. What you're paying for is the fucking last two percent or five percent of performance. You know, that's what you're paying for is that last bit of performance. I mean, any fucking car can get to the gas station and back. Maybe like if you're trying to do something in the quarter mile or something, I mean, you're paying for that tenth of a second, hundredth of a second, you know? And so when you look at rifles that are built for just endurance uh, that are going to just put out a little bit longer than the the other one, you know, not many people will ever see it. I 100% agree. We see that on the car side of things. And that's, I think that's the little nuance that we've we've hopped over is I I don't maybe it's just at the end of the day we all need to be better fucking people but 
the we've problem we've established that. Yeah, it's you two for sure. Yeah. Well, we do need to be better, but I mean, <laughs> we need to we need to work tonight to be better people. But the, 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 and everybody we needs, and we, and we are. Let's start working. You know, maybe next week. But we see it in the car industry as well. And there's always the because you're given a voice, right, a platform via social media or whatever. Everybody thinks that you know your opinion matters, right? And I get that you're because you're an enthusiast about something. There's all different ways to interact with that. You're either looking at something, you're either watching a video, you're reading a magazine back when those were things, you're going to a car show or something like that. And the natural progression is to be like, I've consumed a lot of this hobby. I'm going to tell you my opinion. Sometimes those people don't voice that opinion the correct way, right? And we see that in the car world and we see that in the gun world. My problem with it is in the gun world is if a guy has the money for a Knight's Armament SR25, right? And he's got that, and he's wanting to show a picture. He might have had a, no offense, but, you know, a fucking Timber Creek fucking whatever, dolled out, you know, 10 and a half inch barrel, whatever, back in the day, and he's progressed to the thing. He's like, oh, this is the cool guy shit, right? I've got a Peck 15, and I've got, you know, a, a Nighthawk whatever, and... But because he doesn't use it in the way that people in the industry think he should use it, now he's shit on again, and he's right? A poser but and... what, shouldn't we want everybody to uh, obtain or the achieve best. the best? Like Absolutely. you said, whether they're going to use the 0.1% of it or not, that they've learned the quality and what matters. Bro, that's yeah. just society, yeah. dude. Like, but, but for, yeah, I, I, where you're saying, man, like the internet is a fucking horrible place for feedback, dude. It is, it's a, like it's a great place to showcase your work, to showcase our stuff. But I don't seek feedback from that. You're, you're, you're talking to the dumbest motherfucker in the room, you know. And and by the way, hey, if somebody if somebody leaves a negative comment on anything I've ever posted, I have to like I almost feel sorry for the guy because how like when's the last time you left a negative comment anywhere? You know, like I mean, <laughs> Dude, we discuss this all the time. What type well, no, of I'm person serious. is that? <laughs> well, you're right, right. I mean, like, I mean, I you know, like, I have, uh, I have fucking places to go and people to see and a life to live, and I don't have time to sit here and shit on your painting or whatever the fuck it is that you're that you're presenting. And so, you know, the internet's a horrible place for feedback. And so, if anybody is shitting on a larper or saying you don't need this car, or you don't need that gun, fuck them. Do like, I I'm sorry, your life sucks. That's the only thing I can think of. Like, you, you know, if you were to take the time and actually go to the page, you'd I, I can completely see why you're unhappy, sir. I uh, hope it gets better for you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just but you know, but but like as far as for, with my product, so this is true. Anything that we ever develop for professional end use, I make available to the civilians. I I fundamentally believe in the Second Amendment and its actual meaning, what its real intent was. There is no secret menu. If we develop something that was designed for a professional end user, you can bet your ass. It might take a couple months, it might take a year, but it will be eventually available to our commercial market because that is my, that's why I got into this business, you know? And I say that because uh, unapologetically, I build weapons that end fights. Uh, we build guns that shoot people. And and that's, I mean, yes, they work great on targets and hogs and coyotes and, and whatever, whatever, whatever. But ultimately, whenever, whenever we're manufacturing a gun, I'm thinking of the fact that, that someone may count on this thing to save their life. And, and, uh, and, and high predictability of performance or the fact that it's going to work in that moment where you need it to. So if somebody spent you know, $10,000 on a tricked out rifle with, night, you know, with uh, IR lasers and they have thermal, you know, thermal enablers or thermal uh, inline optics or they have... Uh, Panos or whatever. Well, dude, you know what? If some asshole's climbing through your door at two o'clock in the morning yep. and you have that kind of advantage, guess what? Wrongest house ever, motherfucker. <laughs> like that. That's like that's the way I see it. And like, yes, people might not ever uh, maximize like the, the the firing schedule that the weapon is uh, capable of. But if it just works in that one fucking moment where you really needed to. Then, then, man, that's money well spent. Have you ever spent a better dollar? Yeah. 
and, and, and like one of the we have a, pro, a policy, and uh, and this started actually with me teaching police officers. I would teach armorer schools to cops, and I would they would bring their personally owned guns to class, and I would look at this gun, and I'm asking myself, why in God's name are you carrying this piece of shit? This is a horrible rifle. And the policy was, well, if I use this rifle in a defensive shooting, I'm going to lose it. They're going to take it for evidence. There's a good chance I never get it back. <laughs> so we immediately implemented, so we immediately implemented a policy where if a Sons Liberty rifle was used in a defensive shooting, I'll replace it because that's a horrible reason. I've seen that and, on and your we, Instagram. Uh, fucking it, it, kudos we, to you. That's a great no, policy. But, but, but you know what you left yeah, with? But, you left with your life. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but we we extend this also to civilians too. And, and but I noticed that there was like this uh, this reluctance to invest in the right equipment because if you used it, it would go away. And I'm thinking like, man, can you imagine laying on the street bleeding out? Like, man, if I just would have, you Fuck. know, not bought that Chinese made magazine, <laughs> you know, this all could have gone Another different. Couple bucks. Yeah. Like, Let's <laughs> ditch this up. That was money. Uh, I saved a bunch of money on that shit. Fuck that. <laughs> it's a it's a tool to do your job. Just it like is. we want our guys to hey, invest in it, the proper tools. It's an interesting point. Just like society as a whole, it, people like people have such a chip on their shoulder with anybody getting something like high end, right? It, it's anything. It could be a car. It could be a boat. It could be a gun. It could be a knife. It's like it, you you have to be like the the most highly trained marksman to own that, or like the the. Michael but, Schumacher to drive a Ferrari. Or well, Russell. at the end of the day, yeah. it's yeah. it's like, just shitty fucking people because it goes the opposite. <clears throat> Either it's too cheap, right, and it's a shitty watch, or it's a shitty yeah. chassis, or it's a shitty car, or it's a shitty gun, right, or it's too expensive. It's too nice. Right. It's too nice. It's too big of brakes, right? It's too nice of wheels. It's, it's too, too nice flashy. of this. Too big. Yeah. You, know, you don't need that scope. You don't need that, you know, whatever it is. It's always... It's either too little or too... Nobody's fucking happy. First of all, Rogan's right. Don't read the fucking comments. Fuck off. <laughs> do, do the thing that you do and make it the best, and the people that want it will find you. And don't worry about the fucking haters. Yeah, that, that I, I, I could not... <laughs> I, I could not uh, agree more. And that's, yeah, that's the other thing. No one's that saying, like, you know, th there was this myth in the industry for a long time, and you'd see the comments... You know, it, it, I see it less and less now, I guess, because they've gotten beaten down enough to where they just stop. But they were like, you don't need a $2,000 rifle. You need a $500 rifle and $1,500 in training. I'm like, okay, well, I mean, I, I don't disagree that you should have, or you, you, you should pursue to be better at your skill, or you should pursue training, you know, but your equipment must meet at least some kind of fucking minimum standard. Because, like, you could be the best race car driver in the world, and if your car breaks down 100 feet off the line, you ain't winning many races. All the skill in the world, but your equipment failed you. Yeah. And, 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 and that is absolutely true in firearms. I mean, dude, a lot of these high-profile uh, mass shootings, I mean, which, thank God, it worked out this way. But if you look at a lot of these high-profile shootings, the, the, the suspect's guns failed. Like the Pulse nightclub shooting, the guy was sitting there Googling for like an hour how to get a case on stuck from an out-of-spec chamber. You know, the Aurora shooter, he couldn't clear a double feed, so he switched to an 870. I mean, thank God that yeah. it happened to assholes, right? But it could vary. These are just real-life scenarios of where a gun truly failed, you know? And, and, and if, you, if you deconstruct a lot of high-profile gun incidents, you see uh, guns really do fail. You know, maybe not for you when it's 70 degrees outside, you're on a static range and you're shooting beer cans at your, you know, grandpa's pond. Maybe not then, but when you're when you're under a car you know, at two in the morning, you know, when you're, you know, and someone's shooting back like that's that would be a very unopportune time to get a mechanical stopping. When you're uh, we're this is fucking awesome. First of all, I'm locking it. You're going to admit right now you're coming back and doing this shit in person. Fan, oh, I, I want to be in your old studio, man. I want to hang out, out and see all the stuff. I'm fanboying out. I'm having a good fucking time. <laughs> There's so many questions I want to ask. I want to. I want to know when you're when you're specking out the shit, and you we talked about the transition of now you go in with the power of like this is how we want it made. But throughout that process, what's the first thing that you were like, "Fuck this shit." We've somebody's got to either build this better for us, or we got to build it ourselves. What was the very number one thing that nothing on the industry? Nothing in the industry is going to meet my standards. We've got to do this. 
first part. And when we started getting into like, we, we have a cartridge that we're releasing called the six millimeter max. And it's a six millimeter bullet launched out of a small frame gun. Then I realized that there was no viable way to launch a six millimeter projectile out of a small frame gas gun. Because like the six arc and some of those things, uh, you have to thin the bolt face out so much to fit that larger case. So you're making it, you know, structurally weaker. Mm -hmm. And nobody had addressed, well, if you're going to make it structurally weak, you better make it materially strong. And so we started looking at that. And then we realized, well, we came, you know, some friends of ours were working on a cartridge together. And we, we got together yeah, for the six millimeter max. And we realized that, no, man, you, you can get some uh, really high pressure out of a bolt that will not break and send a bullet you know imagine a imagine a gun that is mechanically robust does not have any mechanical or metallurgical structural weaknesses that performs ballistically as well as guns that that do have all those problems and you can put them together into one package and so like that was kind of whenever we started seeing like not only like at for for the first several years of our company our goal was to exceed the standards in place then was to build a hyper reliable gun that exceeded the, ma the majority of the stuff out there. And then there was a point in which we took a leap and we realized that we're not, we're not trying to tie the industry best. We're, we're trying to exceed the industry best. And that was a leap, you know, and it probably happened you know, a little over two years ago where, I mean, up until then, we would run alongside with any rifle ever built. I don't care who it was, performance-wise, if you were to subject the guns to the same string of fire, we would expect identical mechanical performance, and then we would outperform that company in end-user support, right? So mechanically and, and reliability, I would say, our gun is every bit as good as Company X, and not just that, we will, we will take better care of the end-user than they ever could dream of. And that was our competitive pitch. Well, we're, we'll still take care of the industry, or we'll still take care of the end user to the same to the same fanatical level. But now there are things we that we're we've done and developed that I don't I, I think are quite a bit ahead of a lot of places and at least certain things. So there was a point in which I wanted to match the best performance and then beat them in end user support, and then we made the leap of wanting to just just kick everyone's ass all the way, <laughs> you know, and, 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 uh, Hey, and, and listen, I have a ton of respect. I mean, these guys are, I mean, like, you know, uh, Reed Knight, hero of mine, you know, Paul Buffiani from BCM, hero of mine, like Johnny Nevesky. I'm glad I got to talk to him before he passed away. You did? Uh, yeah, I did. Hell of a sense of humor too. Like huge, Johnny had a hell of a, a sense of humor. I'm a huge Nevesky fag fanboy, whatever you want to call it. Me I, too. I, I, it's me I'm, too. Yeah, I am. I'll, I'll, I'll admit it. Big, big, no, big, everything. Yeah. No, no, Dave, Johnny Novesky was way the fuck ahead of his time. Whenever he started thinking about that, that gas guns could absolutely be used in a precision role. And they started, he started looking at solving real problems. Like Johnny Novesky, way ahead of his time, and the industry owes a lot to that guy. Uh, I mean, and like, like, I'm not like, I praise my competitors all the time because, dude, when I, I I happen to piggyback off of a lot of these dudes, you know. I mean, like, you know, they, they did a lot of my homework for me. Uh, so I'm not too proud to say that at all. I, I do think that right now we're doing some really neat stuff, but I don't forget where we came from. Rest in peace, Johnny Noveski. Hell of a sense oh. of humor, too. That's the thing. Really? Oh, yeah, he was funny as shit. He used to make these port board covers that said uh, surprise cock fag. You know, for, <laughs> and it was from uh, it was from Team America. Yeah. And I, I remember the first time I talked to him, I was uh, my bro was deployed and I was going to send some out as a joke to him. And uh, he I called Nevesky, the, the, the company, and Johnny answered the phone. <laughs> and I was like, look, man, I, I get some of these port doors. He's like, we don't make those anymore. I was like, man, I'm, this is what I'm doing with them. He's like, you know what? And. Like 15 of them showed up, you know, the next day. And uh, that was my first Johnny Nevesky story. I've ne I never met him. Um, I've heard I've heard some crazy stories. I want to know, rest in peace, Johnny Nevesky, but your new 308 barrels, are they going to be the shit? Yeah, yeah. So I'll tell you right now, like large frame gas guns, man, they're 
they're tricky to do right. I think there are very, very few people that do large frame gas guns right. And a lot of times, the I think companies get hyper focused on precision, and then they lose sight of reliability. And so the gun becomes finicky. And in my opinion, if you have a quarter minute gas gun, but you're having to clear a malfunction every mag, go buy a fucking bolt gun. <laughs> you know, uh, like the the goal I think is if you have a true a true one minute rifle that is hyper reliable that thing is going to do anything you ever want it to do. Now, we have a sub-minute guarantee on those, but reliability above all else. I would rather err on the side of reliability than almost anything. What does it mean when you say one-minute gun? I'm gonna, again, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking Roughly, about. Roughly, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I'm not even going to be pretend to try. Go ahead. So, a minute of angle. So, roughly like one one inch at 100 yards. So, if you were to shoot a shot group, it would measure like one inch. That's one minute. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one minute at 200 yards would be two inches. One minute at 300 yards would be three inches. That angle widens as the distance increases. Now, that is... What would you consider a real one MOA gun? How many rounds do you need to put down range to consider it a one MOA gun? That's a great question because people fuck this up all the time and, and, and they have very unrealistic expectations of things. Just three rounds, right? Just three rounds with, with cherry pick yeah. ammo. <laughs> no, so we, we in, in order for us to get a, like a 98 percentile level of probability to, to understand the baseline precision capability of that platform, it's 35 separate five router groups. And then, you know, and, and that's where the data collection starts, right? 35 separate five round groups. And then you take the average of those groups. And that is the kind of baseline precision capability of the gun. I would suggest people go out and actually shoot a 10 round group, a 20 round group, you know, and go and see that shoot with the chrono and then and, and see what your, what your extreme spread and your standard deviation out of that barrel. Is. You know, if you're, if you're talking, talking about real about precision, speed. He's talking about speed on the chrono. No, for, right. for the car guys out there listening, thirty that's 35 different times of five-round groups to get a group that is in a one-inch at 100 yards. So just think about right. what everybody that's talking about. Oh, my, my rifle shoots one MOA. You're talking like a one-inch radius around the... Yeah, so all one inch from spread, center to center. the farthest spread, okay. center of the hole, center of the hole, one inch. Got it. Right, and 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 that's and that's a that'd be a true one minute gun. I mean, you know, we, obviously we, if you, if you select the ammunition that is, that is loaded with more consistency, or if you were to tailor a, a cartridge to that particular chamber and barrel, you should be able to eat, to tighten that up. Uh, what's funny is that a lot of people believe they have a one minute rifle because one time some anomalous group <laughs> turned out to be one minute. You know, but but here's the, the the truth is is that I would I would I would venture to say that 99% of shooters probably aren't one minute shooters. This is I mean, I've I've claimed I'm nine inches from for 45 years. <laughs> <laughs> we just we just proved that uh, through, through simple subtraction. Oh. No, there was one time. Yeah, it was fractional <laughs> and, math, and, and anomalous. Dis- and I disproved it from the toilet paper roll. <laughs> <laughs> I caught you on that whole like three sixteenths, three eighths discrepancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Tape measures, <laughs> metric in England. Clip the end. This off is America. For a I got to step up. For a second. You gonna go ahead? All right. Uh, I think that's that is extremely important for guys, especially when you start transitioning and you start getting a little bit more information, because that sub MOA catchphrase is fucking everywhere. It's on everything. You can buy a trigger group, and it's sub MOA accuracy. Like, well, fuck, how's that gonna happen? Like, yeah, <laughs> take- I think, yeah, that's. I mean, in, in honesty, it's it's irresponsible. I think for it's irresponsible to throw that kind of stuff around, dude. Because uh, I think you're opening your yourself up to uh, a lot of heartache on the customer service side. I mean, you you sell a rifle that you guarantee a sub MOA. Uh, that's conditional. You know, that's, that's like, you know, you, you, like, you don't have Parkinson's like that, you know, you know, you don't, right. you're not blind, you know, <laughs> like, you know, I mean, like, but I mean, is the rifle, if you were to take the human error out of the rifle and it, would the rifle do it? And the answer is yes. But I mean, listen, we, because we have such a crate, we have a craziest warranty in the industry, right? If you back over your rifle with a truck, we'll replace it. If it, 
if you blow it up with the wrong ammunition, if your house burns down and it gets destroyed, I'll replace the gun. So you can, you can imagine some of the warranty claims I've gotten on stuff, dude. The, uh, the, the stupidity that we see is legendary. It's impressive. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, again, we don't have, we have a no questions asked kind of thing. We don't, you know, we don't argue with clients. One of the things that I've noticed about businesses lately is like there's not a lot of emphasis on customer retention. You know, I don't know if companies get so large, and it's not, I'm not talking about guns, I'm talking about any company, right? Where you get so large, like the individual client doesn't matter anymore, and you, you can afford to lose one. Like, we don't, I don't even know what, the, I can't even imagine what that's like. And I've noticed that customer service across the country in every industry has gone to shit. Whether it's a restaurant or a clothing store or whatever else, man, it, it, it doesn't seem like anybody is trying anymore. And when I do see somebody try, like I'm an over tipper. Like if you're if you're that person that's gone, because you'll notice it now. It's you'll easy. Notice it's easy to get a big ass tip. Just like work hard. It, but average, have you have be you, average? Yeah, yeah, you're above. But have you have you noticed? Is it just me or has like the the overall give a shit factor just plummeted? No, oh, nobody, nobody gives a when shit. We were in nothing. Vegas for uh, SEMA last year, we going to a couple of fancy high-end steakhouses and just, like, you were almost, like, kicked out of the restaurant by the waitress. Yeah, what do you want? Yeah, I mean, uh, you're, we're fixing yeah. to spend a fucking shit ton of yeah. money. We're in Vegas. SEMA show is like your shot show, right? Oh, and, I love, and, yeah, of course. Everybody's fucking there. And you go to a re- like you said, it's a, you know you're going to fix and to spend a shit ton of money. And the late, the first interaction with that company, right, with that restaurant, is negative. What are you here for? Well, it's a restaurant, probably to fucking eat. We've got a fucking a reservation. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, so, I mean, I have buddies of mine that own pretty nice restaurants in Vegas, and they told me that they were having a hard time, number one, finding you know people to, to help to work. And then even when they would come to work, they'd have to limit seating, not because they were out of seats, but because, like, there was a the, – the, some of the servers would complain about having too much work. I, I've never, I've never That's worked. Weird, like in a, I've never tipped. worked in a tip-based industry, but I have started a company from nothing. <laughs> There's no such thing, my friend. Well, That's too much fucking work. What, you do, you, what do you do to the the, the gunsmith? Is like, dude, you get you gave me too many rifles to assemble. I just can't do this. <laughs> I can't handle it. <laughs> so, believe it or not, like that. That's a that's a. We don't hire based upon resume. See, my, my, I, like, I travel the country teaching people how to be an armorer, okay? So if someone were to come in with absolutely zero experience, I can teach you how to be one of the best armorers in the country. I can do that. I cannot teach you how to give a shit, right? So our hiring is 100% based upon chemistry and, you know, and, and just kind of attitude and personality and, like, whether or not you believe in the in the overall cause, we had we posted a job opening for two armorers, and we had twenty five hundred applicants. Oh shit! You know, yeah, so you know, the, the, and the believe it or not, the, the one of the dudes we hired, his name was Johnny Araya. He's a Tom Araya's younger brother. It's Tom Araya, the lead singer of Slayer. Wow! And uh, Johnny had spent thirty years on the road uh, with Slayer. Now Johnny had no firearms experience but he did no attention to detail from like i bet you know setting up the stage for slayer you know and that guy was uh i think probably one of the best armorers we ever had no experience whatsoever but attention to detail and willing to like see a job through that that's that's what we look for a guy's listening to this podcast right he maybe has an ar maybe he doesn't right and he's going to either build or buy he can't, unfortunately, he can't afford one of your rifles. Maybe he's like me and have missed out a couple of times on the Tomahawk with your Veil if Solutions collab, right? And now Illinois has passed different laws, and I can't have the Tomahawk. He's going to buy a gun, build a gun. Does he need to focus on barrel, BCG, or trigger group? Here's a bit of advice, a little bit of armorer's tip, man. So every rifle begins its life as a barrel, and we build the rest of that rifle to support that barrel, okay? 
And the way you select the barrel is 100% dependent upon what you want to achieve. If you're doing, if you're building an Overwatch recce gun, okay, then you want to build, you want to select a barrel that is going to do that. If you're building a home defense or a CQB gun, you want to select a barrel that is, you know, optimized for that purpose. Or if you're building a general purpose gun, right, there's links and materials that you could pick. But the task dictates the barrel, and the barrel is going to dictate the rest of that rifle. And if you start out with a shitty barrel, nothing you do to the rest of that gun is going to overcome that. Like, it doesn't matter what, you know, like, you throw a $1,000 paint job on there and a, the most expensive trigger and the coolest furniture and everything else, and the 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 foundation of the gun is shit. So, you know, that that's where I'd put my emphasis. And then let the task dictate the let the task dictate the the equipment. And and if you if you take that route, I think you'll be in better shape than than most. So the paint job's not gonna affect the performance. Paint job doesn't <laughs> paint job's just cool factor. Yeah. That's just to show everybody how cool it is. But the guy on the other <laughs> end doesn't really give a shit. <laughs> So again, novice question: Can you piece together a gun from five, six, seven different manufacturers and have the quality, the fitment, the performance of all in one from one spot purchase gun? I mean, I, I suppose it depends on who, man. I mean, you know, uh, there are probably some world class mechanics that could piece together something, you know, or or, or fabricate something. I don't know. You know, that's, but I, I, maybe that's a poor example to use. That's so far out of my lane. I will say this, that, and, and this is not a sales pitch. It's a, I, I wish I could sell every gun in parts, right? I wish I could just sell parts all day because like there's no Fayette tax, right? There's a firearms excise tax on every complete gun we make. And then we have to burn a ton of ammo on test fire ammo. And then there's all the paperwork of uh, legal paperwork of having to log it in and out of you know custody blah, 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 before we ship it. Like, it's kind of a pain in the ass for us to build a, and, and ship a complete gun, that as opposed to building or just shipping parts, right? So this isn't a sales pitch. But I will say this, guys that build guns in their garage, how many times have they built the exact same gun twice? I'm talking down to the barrel, the screw, the spring, the whatever. You know, most dudes are, hey, I'm going to try this one this time. I'm going to try these this part this time, whatever. When you get into better quality manufacturers, that consistency – we have built that model of gun thousands and thousands of times with absolutely zero variations in the materials, the tolerances, the torque values, the, the, you know, the whole thing. So we have a very high level of predictability of performance. We know what that thing is going to do because we've done it thousands and thousands of times. And I don't, most of your home builders will never be able to achieve that level of baseline predictability because they've never done that now i do not discourage people from building guns in their garage man i mean i think it's it's fun as hell that's how i started my business uh if i was going to if i was if i was acquiring a rifle that i was going to bet my life on i'd probably select one of the top maybe five or six rifle manufacturers in the country that are truly performance based it's a if i didn't own sons of liberty there's a damn short list of places i'd buy a rifle that doesn't mean that there's not a hundred good rifle companies right i'm just saying there's five or six that are better than everybody else who are the worst ones <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> you know the, you know the, the shit part is dude is that like you know price is not always the me the best metric there's very expensive pieces of shit yeah you know, I mean, like, so, you know, it's easy to dismiss a $300 rifle. I mean, you can imagine it's made of shit. But, like, when that rifle costs $3,000, still made of shit. Like, you know, you, you you have to be able to kind of either understand the, the, the individual specifications of the gun, or you have to be at least somewhat familiar with the, the firing schedules that gun was built to achieve. And so, I mean, like, you know, the... There's a lot of three thousand dollar guns that would not submit for independent destructive testing. Yeah, they they would not want that information out there. <laughs> Barrel nut torque or castle nut staking? Both. 
Both. <laughs> both. Both. I mean, like, you know, if if if, uh, if if somebody said, "Hey, man, have you seen that new company? Uh, you know, Johnny Big Dick Tactical, whatever." I mean, that's a cool. And company. they hand it. Yeah, you probably yeah, have and, it, them. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, they hand me that rifle. The the very first thing I would look at. This is a guy who's inspected tens of thousands of guns from every manufacturer you could possibly imagine. Before Sons Liberty was like a national brand, I mean, all we would do is is go in and unfuck other people's guns, right? So, anyways, if someone handed me that rifle, the very first thing I would look at is that castle nut. Very first thing. And if that was done wrong, you can start making a lot of educated guesses about else about what else you're going to find as you look under the hood. It, it tells you a lot about the competency of the person who built it and, and the give a shit factor. Knew, if that part was done wrong. Nut. You better have that fucking cotter pin no, in there. The castle nut <laughs> is the castle nuts on the back of the receiver, right? For the buffer tube, okay. right? The castle nut, what tightens up the buffer tube to the lower receiver, yeah. right? And then you've got a buffer plate. You've got a plate that holds a spring in that needs to be staked, right? You got to stake that. Sons of Liberty has a very special way of doing you, you do a, uh, what is it UFCI uh, castle nut? Yeah, well, the, it's a uh, forward control, and again, like what's what's funny is if I were to go down the line, like after a day's worth of production, there could be you know two hundred rifles lined up or something, you know. And uh, if you were to walk down the line and grab a random rifle, I can tell you which one of my guys built it by looking at the staking. It's almost like a signature, you know. And now, of course, welding. I just like the, yeah, just yeah, like well, I do the same here. You can tell everybody's yep. signature. Yeah, and, 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 and every rifle that leaves is signed by the guy that built it, and signed by the guy that inspected it, because we know these rifles are going to go out, and many of them will be used to protect a life. And you know, there's a level of ownership with that rifle. If something, God forbid, happened to that gun, if it did not perform the way it was intended, like. It's not like it's some they're returning it randomly to a company. No, you you can go up to the dude that built it and ask well, what well, what happened, What's or the that? guy that you know, or or, or the or the second set of redundancy, the second set of eyes that inspects it. No one's allowed to inspect their own work. You know, uh, that that's just the way it is. I I, I have a question for you guys. Actually, I, I was part, I was looking at, yeah. So y'all obviously. In the car restoration side, when someone sends you a car to restore, are they basically at that point handing over a blank check with no expectation of uh, at all of what it might cost to complete, or is there at least a guess of like uh, what this thing's going to cost to finish? We, is that yeah. a weird question? No, I'm we, sorry. No, we we talk about uh, guardrails, boundaries, so like. Depending on what you're wanting to do, we start to having that conversation of like, what is it the things? And then they, you know, they always talk about, well, I like this car, or I like this car, or I like this car, whether it's cars that we built or friends of ours or other competitors that built. I like something like this, but of this. Then you start right. talking about, well, it could range from this to this, you know. And we don't we don't start until you feel like, oh, okay, no problem, I'm good with that range. But sometimes they're trying to build that gun that has never been built before. There's you know, there's they, times that yeah they they come to you and be like, what if uh, what if it could shoot lasers? Yeah. <laughs> what, no matter what it costs, we want to shoot lasers. <laughs> no, that uh, but that's a that's a really fair question. I, I recently went through a car restoration thing and and it was a, a bizarre experience. Yeah, you know, they quoted me. Uh, 18,000 for a paint job and then they sent me the invoice after the work was done for 42,000 run away and what did, what did and, you have painted what was it so i i actually collect i like like h1 hummers and this thing oh, i bought was and, 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 and these things uh like this civilian you know i anyways this thing turned into a i mean i spent like 90 grand and we were no closer to finishing that car than the day i dropped it off <laughs> and it's been like two and a half years and I and that was my very first experience with car restoration, and I just wanted to ask: Is that is that how it usually goes? No. <laughs> was it? I mean, no. what was the conversation leading up to it? It was that here you provided me with this Hummer, and this is exactly what the paint job's going to cost, or was it? Yeah, that was no, no. I was given like an exact quote okay. for what the paint job would cost, and, and you know what? And I understand. 
I understand if if, uh, if an estimate goes over ten percent, fifteen percent, you know, yeah. shit happens, or we had to we had to buff this out, or we had to get this about when something goes up, you know, hundred and something percent, like, you know, I'm wondering like at what point. But anyways, I did like I said, I, I've had one car restoration experience, dude, and, and it it kind of kind of ruined it. I mean, because fucking horrible. you know, yeah, I'm, I'm like, look, I'm like, you know, like ninety grand in, you're like, look, man we've gotten this far. Just tell me what it would take to finish it. I'm like, we can't, man, just send another 20 grand. And we're going to do our best. I'm like, bro, the car was like in really good condition. When I sent it to you, I just wanted new upholstery. And, you know, does, he, does, you know? he, does he know what you do for a living? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Dude. I just, like I said, like I, you know, I, I was really excited to talk to you guys. Cause that, uh, that just doesn't doesn't sound like the way it should. Now, granted, if someone sent you a car and they want it to fucking levitate, well, it's going to cost what it costs, dude. Yeah, know? right. That's that we we talk. That's another thing we talk about a hundred fucking thousand times on this podcast is similar to the gun industry. Is somebody new to the hobby, new to the industry, or 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 maybe they're not even new. They're just leveling up, right? Everybody levels up in something that they've been into for a while. Right. And they level up, but they level up into a position and they get they get hooked up with a company or somebody that's going to provide a service that doesn't meet their expectations. And it's so often that they that at that point they stop leveling up. They find a new hobby. They're like, fuck that. I'm not going to get <laughs> fucked anymore in the gun world, in the car world and whatever it is. Well, I'll I guess if you just else. don't know what to I guess if you just don't know what to expect, you know, you know, uh, and that's what it was for me, man. It's like I just I didn't I didn't know what to expect, and so like it, it became like this never ending deal for him. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you what. The next car I restore, I'm, I'm shipping it to you guys. <laughs> Fantastic. We can figure that out. Yeah. The, uh, do, do, you, a, do y'all do, do y'all do the restoration stuff, or y'all just do custom builds, or all of it? We don't do anything like that's like a, what you would consider a stock restoration, like putting it back the way it was. So it's right. primarily pretty custom builds. We uh, use the body shell, and then everything else is modernized and upgraded. And inside that sounds and underneath. Just like you're that you're building awesome. an AR that's around about you know Stoner's platform, right? Right. You're right. not you're not changing very much, but you're you're stay you know. But you're changing you're changing everything, you're changing everything yeah. right? You're fitting inside that platform. Well, I've seen some of y'all's vehicles, man. That it is that is art, man. That is art. What got it's you amazing. into cars in in the Thanks, first man. place? Well, I'm a guy. Mechanic. You know, <laughs> you're, 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 like, if you're into guns, you're into cars, you're into, they're all mechanical things. No, know? but yeah, I think it's like anything, right? A lot of a lot of my clients, myself included, we like watches, uh, yeah. we like cars. I think it's anything that, like, you know, some level of some level of uh, passion and craft and talent and you know mechanical know how goes into like. There's something very cool about that, you know. Uh, I think it's sad that. I think it's sad that there's that you know I, I, I bet you there's not that many people under 25 that could change their own oil. Oh, you know, uh, you know, or I mean, I, I, I bet like the triple A is probably a hell of a business to be in right now because I doubt people would change their own tire. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, so like the you look at cars, watches, weapons, good. Wi- I mean, anything that put that that took a little bit of effort to do well. You know, I think that appeals to people that have good taste in, in things. You know, it translates. It's, I bet you our demographics are not all that different. I'm no, gonna I'm gonna not. fuck with your head, Mike, and and in yours too. Mine too. What are you? Where are you going? So what are we doing? We've talked about this hundred. We're we are all very similar in. We like watches. We like the mechanical things. Yeah. We like guns. We like the mechanical things. We like cars. We like the mechanical things. All of the stuff, the put the putting together, there's different people that are way more into cars, way more into guns, way more into watches, or all three, right? We all get into those things, and we're thinking, like, that's the thing that's going to make us. We, we're so intrigued in that. You know how much women care about that? Zero. If we were into fucking poetry, we'd be getting fucking laid over, over and over and over. <laughs> The, all the yeah. things that the guys are into, <laughs> fucking chicks don't give a shit about. We're what? married, so we can yeah, fucking. You know, we, of, we can you fuck around with watchers and, and cars. Yeah, we're, we're, we're married. But they don't. They also don't care about guns. They poetry. also don't care about cars. They also don't care about watches. You know what you'd be I, I, missing if you were into poetry? 
What? Me as a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're getting laid if you're into poetry. Yeah, so you better be getting laid a lot to keep, <laughs> keep you like, you know, busy. Right? It's funny. How, like, it but it's it's it 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 goes across the board of guys like into tools, into word working, yeah. into uh, yeah, you're, yeah. I you're mean, so it, into the things. Right. It's yeah. yeah it's, I mean, maybe it's they call it toxic masculinity, I guess. But it, it's if you're into one of those things, you're into them all. Like I love guns, right? I, I'm not a knowledgeable gun guy. I mean, I know enough to be dangerous. Got some interesting, cool stuff, but I, I'm not Josh. I'm not I'm certainly not you. But same way, man. Guns, knives, watches, cars, boats, anything that's mechanical. That's something that somebody created and put passion into. It's fucking rad. It you know? always comes down to the appreciation of somebody else's effort and and power and mentality to create it. You know what I'm saying? Or, or, yeah. it's boats or watches or guns it's or cars. Appreciation for the craft to me. It's a, like it's appreciation it's, it's, for it's the, the craft. It's the same thing with the like design and making stuff yeah. cool and how they did it. Right. Yeah. You look at like record players. Fucking pens. Like you could exactly. get a. 99 cent big pen, but I know but this one leaks, yeah. <laughs> but it's the same. Hey, dude, there's, and, there, and there's a, and there's a legitimate performance gap, dude. I mean, something like that pen, dude, I bet you that pen feels better in your hand than a big dude. You know, I bet you it's more pleasurable oh, it to write, you know, to sign your name with that pen. I mean, even something as simple as that, I could appreciate that. And you, and you can, you can, there's a, an appreciable performance difference, or at least overall satisfaction of use dude you know if you're talking about a, a fucking boat that just cranks dude or something that's going to putter down I'm like you know there's there's a gap in the level of enjoyment you're getting out of it and unfortunately like you know well, our realistically performance usually costs some money yeah you know it's that's ball size that's, that's <laughs> <a> trans, <laughs> generally relation to ball yeah. size smaller boat yeah, slower Bigger balls, <laughs> faster. Uh, uh, it's nice just what course. it is. It, we're all peacocking at the end of the day. Hey, dude, that, you know, one, one day, one day, all of us, dude, we're, are going to get to the age to where you're not going to enjoy that shit. I mean, you know, like, don't get me wrong. I'll still be that awkward, you know, 80 year old, like, you know, <laughs> like crawling, crawling, crawling into my fucking sports car, dude. You're but, uh, snorting but you don't look at, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Snorting Viagra, you know, <laughs> like, like, you know, there's a point in which, like, you're just not gonna en enjoy it, and and you know, now now is the time you you can, you know, it, it. I at least I think I think there's a finite level of of when you appreciate this stuff. Perhaps like in different stages of life, you learn to appreciate other things, and perhaps you you seek whatever. But you, like people that wait till they're retired to buy that fucking dream car. Well, you know, what are you going to do? Drive it to the fucking pharmacy and back? <laughs> yeah. And crawl, take you fucking 10 minutes to roll out of it and yeah. stand up. <laughs> hey, let me ask you guys, man. What, you know, this this stuff with the, you know, the, the, there seems to be like a war on the internal combustion engine, man. Oh, you man. know, yeah. where, where, you know, what do you think, dude? I mean, you, do you honestly see, is it even logistically possible for them to, to, to ban the internal combustion engine by 2035. Well, just, I hope you remember this because I'm coming fucking back. We're all coming back in 20 fucking years and you ask you about the fucking bullet versus the laser because yeah. fuck you. <laughs> all right? well, you're not going to be here in 20 years. Yeah, maybe not. Yeah. You guys. So will. the fact of the matter is, is that like, yes, they could ban it, but no, like 1000% they can't. It, it. They can't it, it is not a viable alternative, nor can it sustain or exist. And we've had an interesting, like, look behind the curtains into it that, like, I mean, we just got back. Look, we just flew back this morning from Blueprint Engines out of uh, Kearney, Nebraska, right? 210,000 square foot of the most unbelievable manufacturing. And you know what? The majority of what they manufacture is outside of hot rod engines is internal combustion generator engines. Thousands, tens of thousands of them. Big block Chevrolets. Big block okay. Chevrolets. And the the fact of the matter is, is that most of the power grid cannot support, like, even what we're doing now, let alone add more EVs, EV charging, anything electric. So you go, like, into places, you'd be shocked. There's fucking big block Chevys in basements of huge 
high rises that are powering things. Tesla a fucking, power, Tesla yeah, power yeah, plants. Yeah, yeah. A fucking big block Chevy with a turbocharger <laughs> on it. This is the reality. I mean, in, in, in gen sets and generators all over the world, like they, these, and it, that's not the first time we heard that. I mean, we sat here with uh, Zach from Z Rods. Mm-hmm. They were talking about they've got a local uh, friend uh, manufacturer that generators, generators might be, internal combustion generators might be like the next like gold rush. Right, it, it could be the hot rod generators. Well, maybe. Well, I mean, they're they're you're you're talking about you're you're powering, you know, a dozen EV cars off of one, you know, ice engine. But the fact of the matter is, is those ice engine wouldn't exist if it wasn't for yeah. those, you know, EVs. Yeah. It's it's not it's not realistic. It's I don't have any problem with the technology advancement of. Oh. Automobile propulsion. When it comes to you don't deserve this or you can't have this or you're not smart enough to make the the purchasing decision on X because we are smarter than you, that's when I have a problem on it. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, there's a point to which I would imagine the performance, the performance will make me want to go out and buy one. I mean, you know, I mean, like, I mean, you know, you look at some of these like that, 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 that cyber truck looks pretty cool for the the shit I've seen, you know, it, right. You know, the, the, you know, at some point the, the, the performance gets there. Uh, but yeah, like you, but, but what's, what's unattractive is when it's no longer your choice, yeah. when it's no longer your option. And I think that's so like, I look at the car world, I look at meat, like, you know, I look yeah. at like beef farmers, I look at the, Car world and I look at guns a lot in the same vein of these very unrealistic ideological ideological uh, vectors that are not based in fucking reality. And you know, I would imagine that the internal combustion engine is going to be around a long time. I have to imagine that you know, gunpowder, uh, firearms are going to be around a long time, and so is cheeseburgers. Yeah. Uh, you know, but if you listen to the rhetoric, dude, it's just. It's just wow, you know. It seems like everything I like is under attack. Everything I like is under attack. But you know? that's that's what makes you question the whole fucking reality. Is like, yeah, what are they just forcing you into decisions that you would have never made because they're saying you can't have something? Like, am do they know that our rebellious nature is what it is? And you're like, fuck ice engines. I'm going to go to, you know, EV or vice versa because they're telling us to go whatsoever. Like, I mean, in the end of the day, the reality of it is, is market it for what the fuck it is, right? Like, I would entertain buying one. Like, I think a Rivian is a cool ass. Like a smaller, truck. like a smaller one. No, I, th- I think a Rivian, it's a high style vehicle. I think they did a great job with the cosmetically it looks great. It's got all sorts of cool functions. It's got QC problems lately. Okay, but the reality of it is, is that like I could see... It's fast. You can save money on gas. I'm not fucking buying that to save the environment. I'm buying it yeah. because my wife drives like within a hundred mile radius, fucking all over the place, carting the kids around. It's like, oh, that would actually be maybe kind of cool. Like, are you I, gonna pay somebody to come in and like install the fucking charging system at the house and all that kind of yeah, stuff? Yeah, but I, but I'm also cord. not looking for like apples to apples. I'm not pinching pennies, right? Right. I'm like, okay, that that. Well, you're not that, virtue signaling. Yeah, it's you're, a, not, you're not virtue signaling. You're not telling people you're I'm, I'm fucking morally superior either. He's gonna you know? have a coexist bumper sticker on the back. I mean, no, that's a cat. That's a I'm a cat guy. <laughs> no, she will. Yeah, cat, I'm a cat. Cat member. thumbs up. Yeah, meow, <laughs> meow. <laughs> <laughs> but that you get what I'm saying, right? No, I, I do. It, it's that there, there's a convenience with it. It's like, well, you don't have to go to the fucking gas station. It's it's there's something kind of cool. It's fast. It's nicely styled. It's got cool electronics. It's a little bit of we got some future shit going on, but it's not fucking good for the environment. You're not saving trees. You're not saving the planet. You just buy it because of what it is. I, See, I, that's I, the thing. You, you, I, when you talk to when you talk to honest people, like honest people, people that question the narrative. I mean, I come from an industry that's under constant attack by bullshit narrative that's not fact based. You know, I imagine you guys are probably in a similar industry. Um, you know, it's that. There's this narrative that uh, you know EVs are going to save the planet. Like until you go see like what that mining operation looks like, or you know, right now there's statistics that they like to say that um, firearms are the leading cause of death of children. You know, higher than cancer and automobiles. 
Well, if you look at the the structure of that statistic, it's including children sometimes up to the age of 21. And if you're talking about gang violence in like inner city Chicago, well, then yeah, you know, the majority of those deaths are from 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 year olds shooting each other, you know, that, but you present that data to a, a well-intentioned soccer mom and they're thinking they're picturing like four year olds right. or something, you know, not gang fucking bangers Or you talk about like, you know, same thing, I guess, with the car thing and the emissions and everything else. I mean, it's just that there's a level of dishonesty to the rhetoric. Well, unfortunately, that, that dishonesty affects us all. It affects us all. Nobody and cares so about honesty versus dishonesty on social media. That's how everybody consumes their fucking media. Tell me, how many guns could you build if you were paying the same wages they were to mine the fucking cobalt? <laughs> you, could, you could build a shit ton of fucking yeah. guns, couldn't you? Yeah, every, every human being on the planet could have one in their hands. Yeah, at, it's... At, 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 those wages it's fucking nuts but we just yeah we can't just be normal and rational no. and look at that and be like oh yeah that's you actually hide the bad yeah that's oh, actually yeah. super fucked up you know that it's blatantly obvious you know uh, along with like the pollution like that's the first thing you're gonna look at the pollution is just the vehicles in the united states of america the internal combustion vehicles right. like california's fucking around with weed whackers and chainsaws first of all those motherfuckers aren't using chainsaws or like Bunch of liberals. They're not cutting <laughs> shit for trees down. Dude, look what they right. do with the gas can. And they burn the, the trees just, end up burning the fuck down anyway. I could down go, there, I could which go, is probably worse for the fucking environment than the damn exhaust from the I internal could go combustion buy engine. A, right. A, a, right now, a 1995 F 250 Ford diesel, right? And put out less emissions than all the shit they're doing in fucking generators and charging stations yeah. and all that. And just drive that motherfucker. Extend the cab. Maybe like a maroon and silver two tone. Yeah, while smoking menthol cigarettes. Of course. Yeah. 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 Do, you, do you guys have those wind farms up there? Those big giant turbines. Oh, we yeah. not. We don't have them by us, but just outside of yeah. Illinois, you, you get into uh, Indiana, and they're as far as you can see. No, it sounds familiar. I mean, like I I sold guns to Moms Demand Action. You know, whenever, uh, so I, you know, I, I, I spent, I'm serious. I, I spent a lot of time, you know, I do a lot of advocacy stuff. I, you know, I go speak at, you know, schools, colleges, or town halls and stuff. And they would set up debates where they'd have like a gun control advocate. And then I would, you know, represent because I'm a very fact based type of, when I'm, when I'm explaining my position, it's not from my, you know, from my cold dead hands. You know, you're not going to win a whole lot of sport that way. Interestingly enough, like the, when COVID kicked off, these these ladies that would oppose me at these like you know uh speaking events and these events i was the only gun guy they knew because like before you go out on stage and beat the fuck out of each other you know you're in the back drinking coffee talking about life and then you go out and then you do your little debate i was the only gun guy they knew when covid kicked off they realized that they were the only person on the block without a gun and when they had to defend their own toilet paper stash, yeah. all right, guess what? <laughs> they needed a gun. And get in what was what I love, and I, I tell the story. It's true. Not once did they ever ask me for the gun that held the least amount of bullets. When it came time for their own personal fear or their own safety, or having to take into consideration that emergency services might not be responding, or things could get a little bit weird. All of a sudden, like all of the bullshit, all of the talking points, all of the whatever went out the window. Man, what is the fucking biggest gun? What's the what? biggest capacity you got? Fucking Becky wow, over there was, was asking for drum mags. She's like, you got any of them yeah. underground fucking drum mags? <laughs> or it's like, you got a belt? You got a yeah, fucking belt? It, it, <laughs> yeah. It is like, you know, it's like ideology versus reality. <laughs> and, and, and you got the C when they intersect. And it's like, oh, you, yeah. And, so, and I happily told, and I've noticed. I've noticed that these people, once they've, like, and this is true across the board, gun control has never been less popular than it is today. It really isn't. The only people that are really advocating for gun control are like your, like your funded politicians that are getting, that are taking money from a very well funded gun control lobby. You know, your Michael Bloomberg's and shit. The gun industry does not have a Michael Bloomberg. Like the wealthiest person that I can think of, the only, the only billionaire. I can think of that ever made their wealth from guns was Gaston Glock. And he was like number like 1800 on the list or something. Right? I mean, clearly not a pauper, but he's also not 
Michael Bloomberg, you know, or or George Soros. The amount of money that goes into opposing gun ownership is astronomical. Sure. You, you know, so anyways, to, to, to your point, uh, they didn't want that shit in their backyard, and all of a sudden those differences, you know, you know, united really quick. And I saw that, you know, when people were worried about defending their toilet paper, you know, all of a sudden the pamphlet went in the trash can and like, give me the, give me the heavy shit. They must have that Costco fucking charming double oh, roll. They get, they get some, yeah. <laughs> what do you think the percentage was of like first time gun owners through COVID? Because we we would go to the uh, you know gun stores by us regularly, and it was crazy. I mean, absolutely nuts. Lines right? wrapped around the building. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, how many of those people do you think were people like what you're describing, where it was somebody that was so opposed to it? That all of a sudden they're like, hey, I, some, what if somebody's coming for the Charmin, you know, double twill, you know, cross hatch oh, oh. toilet those paper? Are, those are heirloom <laughs> tomatoes. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. that's but, 200 maybe. years. First, the guy who's like, I've already got a couple thousand, you know, rounds. Uh, I just want to add to it just because, like, because I want, like, I want fucking More. tens of thousands of rounds. So, I, I, was, I was in the industry at the. When I was building guns in my garage, was like right after Sandy Hook, right? And the Sandy Hook gun rush, you could not find an AR-15 anywhere. You couldn't find a bolt carrier group. You couldn't find a 5.56 five, cartridge. That stuff, or a magazine, that stuff was gone. But everything else was still on the shelf. Pump shotguns, 12 gauge ammo, uh, semi, you know, like uh, compact pistols, revolvers. That shit was still there. You could buy all you want. It was AR-15s that people bought after Sandy Hook. Because they were afraid they would not be able to buy them again. They bought them because they were afraid that they were going to become illegal. COVID, that was not the situation. Okay? You couldn't find a pump shotgun. You couldn't find a revolver. You couldn't fuck AR-15. Okay? You couldn't find optics. You couldn't find body armor. You couldn't find night vision. You couldn't find any of that, which tells me... These people were not buying guns because they were a, they were scared of losing the right to own guns. They were buying guns because they thought they were going to have to fight because all the peripherals were gone too. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, you know, you couldn't find a lever action rifle. Yeah. So, so the 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 mentality versus Sandy Hook versus the last gun rush we were in, that was people stockpiling stuff and shoving it under their fucking mattress. This this last one that we had, that was people thinking they were going to fight. So in case people are wondering what the actual condition of the country is, I can tell you this, never in the history of our country has the populace been better armed than they currently are now. <laughs> you know, but, and that means people that you get along with and people that you don't. Yeah. So, you know, that's probably worth thinking about. You know, there's a lot of people that fantasize or romanticize the idea of some type of armed revolution. But I can tell you right now, man, like there's not two Americas. There's not. There's 500 Americans. And I've had this conversation several times that you might agree with somebody on 95% of your worldview, but that 5% you're willing to shoot each other over, you know? And and so, like, the people that kind of romanticize the revolution, I, I, I don't. I, I think that would be, number one, I think it's absolutely possible. And I think without a major trajectory change in, like, a uh, bringing the, the the rhetoric down and, and trying to, to heal some of the divide. I think that's absolutely a realistic potential outcome. You know, um, I don't romanticize about it at all. And, I, and and that's why I hope I'm hoping that, you know, podcasts and alternative media sources and this kind of stuff can overtake the divisive, you know, legacy media type shit. That's it's really done a number on this country. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? Of, of, of a sit down conversation changes so many things. It does. Everybody, everybody's quick to talk about what they would fucking do on the internet. You get face to face, things change a little bit. It's just the way it is. Uh, if you were doing anything else besides what you're doing right now, what would it be? Man, I'd probably go be a hunting guide or something. Cool. The hunting or fishing guy, that's, I mean, like, you know, I, I can't think of anything else to which I would get this level of satisfaction of doing. And 
I mean, I, I, I do not feel it. If I won the lottery tomorrow, I'd still show up for it. I, I, I really, I really love what I do. And the only other thing I can imagine is, you know, probably a hundred fishing guys. Other than that, man, I'd, I'd be fucked. <laughs> if you put me in a cubicle, man, I'd just, you know, I, I don't know. Hope, hope it's not on the, the 10th floor and I'd be out the window. <laughs> you, seem, you seem so PC, though. <laughs> best best car movie and why? Oh, man. That's a... Uh... Dude, what got me into cars was probably, like, like embarrassingly, like, Cannonball Run. Oh. You know, like, the Cannonball that's, movies, dude. That's like a fucking that. winner. Yeah, you're yeah, just I, further that, solidifying the man crush here. Oh, <laughs> we're, Josh we're a, fucking on a yeah. Lot. Yeah, we, we're, yeah, Josh is a cannonball run. Cannonball runs a fucking shit. It really is. It, it, it really, I mean, like it's, a, it's just a it's just a great movie. Great, great all of it. Um, Best piece of advice you've ever received? Oh man, um. Or give, dude, because you've had, I mean, you had some bangers when we started. Yeah, if you got to give so. some advice, give it to. Yeah, well, I mean, some of the things I'm most grateful for are is, is the advice I didn't take. Because when you're starting a business or you're doing something and you're thinking about something bold or you have a big idea or you have a big plan or a big vision, there's a lot of people that think small that will tell you how you ought to do it. And you gotta be a little bit kooky, I think, in order like to to stake it out on your own and go go. You'd be a little crazy to go suffer the the bullshit of what it takes to get something off the ground. But if you have big goals, man, like I'm grateful for a lot of advice I did not take. There were plenty of times where people said, "Play it safe," or "Turn down this," or "Do this," and and like I kind of went all in all the time on certain things, and I, I think. I think it worked out. It very easily couldn't have. I, I believe there was a lot of luck involved for how many times I went all in and it worked out. You know, all it took was being wrong one. <laughs> you know, uh, but I, I guess the best advice, man, is just kind of I, I, I could I could live with failing on my own terms. I can live with that. <clears throat> if I failed on my own terms, I could live with that. But you know, feeling on somebody else's terms, like that'd be a harder pill to swallow. <laughs> That's good. Really good. First, ca- first car and story about that car. You take it. You take it. Take Man, a, so you can take a shot at it. You really, you really I'm asking you. I mean, you guys are. What year? What year? You're connecting I'm a, here. You're in tune. I'm. A, what like year did you turn 16? Window. 1996. 96. Fuck. About the same age. Though. 96. I I got my license in 95. Uh, 96 in Texas. Well, you gotta, is, Did you buy your car? Was it, a, was it a hand-me-down? No, my, uh, my, my mom actually bought me, bought me my first car. And it's kind of a, have a interest. It's going to be hard to guess this one. Oh, hard to guess. That makes it a little more intriguing. <laughs> uh, exotic, exotic, maybe. 95. 96. 96, 95, 96. Uh, <clears throat> it's American. It's American for sure. You think it's American? Yeah, I think he was instilled American values, American manufacturing, it's Texas. Definitely American. As American as it gets. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, if you say this, it's probably fuck, it's either Chevy or Mopar at that point. Like when you say American, American people like fucking Mopar is a very patriotic kind of brand. Uh, fuck, but that era, that was a shitty era for, for the Mopars. So I, I pulled on Dakota a while back and I, I fell short. I'm not feeling Dakota. We, we, we went to Dakota too many yeah. times. Of that fucking era. Shit, this is difficult. So it's not just your cliche Chevy pickup. No, it's a, it's an '89 F-150 silver maroon two tone extended cab. Hmm. I was leaning F-150. It's an '89 F-150 
maroon and silver extended cab. You're going F-150? Yeah, I, I wasn't going that specific. Okay. It's just F-150's lingering. Dude, I think I'm tired today. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I'm you're not, just going, yeah. what, I'm gonna car? No, I'm going to step up. I'm just going to step out of this one. Bet you drove a truck. No, I don't have a... I don't you have nothing. Solid. It's you're not, stepping it's, out. It's not Bowing out. me. I'm going to bow out of this All right. One. Mike, what was your first car? It was a it was a fucking H one wagon. Oh no. shit! Yes, nobody would guess that. No. So the story, <laughs> the story behind that, there was a my my mom. I was the only child. My mom, yeah, you know, my my, yeah, you know, my my dad took off when I was you know pretty young, and uh, you know, mom was kind of like like a little bit overly protective, like almost like obsessively protective. And uh, we went to to go get my first car. And uh, the we went to a dealership that was a GM dealership, and they also sold, you know, Hummer, right? You know, Amer- American. This is before they were AM General. And the AM General, yeah. And so the uh, the the car salesman was like, she was looking at like a, a Tahoe or a Suburban or a whatever, or a or a tank. Or a, yeah, it was, <laughs> and, the, and the 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 the, the, uh, the car salesman was joking and said, "Like the only thing safer than this fucking suburban is one of those Hummers." <laughs> and there you go, man. It was, uh, <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> and, and, that, and that was that was the car I drove to high school, man. Which, by the way, don't do that. Let me just tell you, man. Do not do that to your kid. My, I love my mom; she's my very best friend in the whole world. But that kind of fucks you up a little bit. <laughs> you know, when that's, sure. when that's, How much shit did you just run over and drive through in high school? Oh, dude, yeah. Garbage well, I mean, cans could just clearly. be unfazed. Oh, could we, dude. I mean, on my on my drive to school, we would like take it into like you know like city ditches and stuff. You know, I mean, it was like you know it's. It, 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 um, it, we, I did exactly what any sixteen-year-old would do with that fucking thing, dude. And, and I will say, like, I, I, my my children are going to have, uh, you know, Honda Civics. Like, well, well <laughs> probably older, older, older pickup trucks or older something, you know. And then uh, if you want something crazy, you better uh, you better figure out what you're going to do with your life. You know? <laughs> so we usually right after that, we always ask. Oh. When did you wreck it or did you wreck it? Which 99, I'd say 0. 0.5, 99.5% of the people we've asked us to. Successful ones have. Had a serious accident or wrecked their first car, but I don't think you can wreck that thing. Those, oh, dude, I wrecked it all the fucking time, dude. But you so, never wrecked it, wrecked. It was never totaled, right? You just. No, 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 no. I, I never totaled a lesser vehicle, you probably. Just shit. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, I, I mean, like, dude, totaled you know, you know. You you knocked the side view off of one of those things, dude, which I did a lot. Yeah, you know, that sonic driveway, that sonic drive through is a lot smaller than you think. Yeah. You know, like, uh, no, I, I I did um mostly just dumbass stuff like that, but yeah, that was that was it. And 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 that was kind of the reason why I got I, I had this other one restored when I was buying it on this one was because I yeah, I wanted to restore it to like it's you know like one that was identical to the one I first had, and that, yeah, that was it. <laughs> what are your views on Josh's current dream car, the more civilian version of the bright yellow H two with the chrome package? That's the AutoZone add-on. No, I'm I'm fucking Lamborghini. <laughs> I'm LP. No, you're not. It's when did you transition to that? You know, first of all, you, dude, we've you got guys, it. they're right up there. You guys have made this false narrative of me being an H2. I'm never, yeah, I'm, you just look like an H2 guy. I'm an H1 guy or I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Lambo H3. LP guy. I'm not, didn't Gaddafi, didn't Gaddafi have one of those? The, the Lambo, like, the, like their fucking original off road, yeah, like desert truck. Yeah, the LP 2000. It's a fucking, that I, thing was mean. Yeah, it was mean. Uh, I don't know if I'd be like, Categorize a Qaddafi. You know, that's it. That's, 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 I just remember for some reason every every time I every time I hear about one of those, it's for some reason what I associate with. But I'll tell you, like, have you seen those Gherkins? No. Is that the, the, the fender looking thing? The Gherkin? It's a small pickle, isn't oh, it? They, oh, they're delicious. I know it's <laughs> I think it's a fucking pickle. <laughs> yeah. There's a there's a company there's out of there. Canada that makes like this fucking armored vehicle it's yeah. called it, it's built like on an, uh, a ford F, like f550 chassis or something that thing looks pretty crazy 
Mm. I think that'd be like the old Canadians would name it. The gherkin. The gherkin. (laughs) Canadians Canadians are fucking weird. Go over there and get the gherkin. Uh, All right. First of all, Mike, you got to come back and do it again. Number two, when's the MK10 shipping? In case a guy maybe wanted a 308, like Sons of Liberty rifle. So Mark 10s are actually the V2s are in production now. And for you guys, uh, obviously, uh, you know, once we click off of here, man, y'all guys take my number. Anything you ever need, uh, hit me up direct, man. And I, you know, I, if I have to smuggle it into your Tommy Fade on my, you know, in my <laughs> trunk, I will. It's, we'll cut all this out, but we're, we'll, we'll figure some things out. Yeah. Yeah. Remember how I got started, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, the, thing, the thing we're not going to cut out. Because we we blew past my fucking standard question, we're gonna blow past that because okay. I I feel like this is one that's important to me. I don't think tonight. you should answer this. It's, it's important to me tonight yeah. because you brought up uh, Cannonball Run. Who wins in a fight? Who, who wins <laughs> oh, in a fight? Okay. Burt Reynolds, Sylvester Stallone. Are you fucking high? No, I think this is because this is a guy you admire, and I, I'll give. All right, so I want this his, settles it. Whatever Mike's answer then is, then we lay it to rest. Then we'll lay it to rest. This has been an ongoing saga. I've taken Burt Reynolds. Jeremy's I, taken yeah. Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, no weapon. I got the, no weapon. No, Burt Reynolds did. Oh, fuck. <laughs> well, dude, the guy, hey, the, the, the guy was a legitimate college athlete, man. Like, your guy was a, uh, uh, kind of a badass dude. And what's that Daniel I, Defense I, dude's name? Where do you, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Oh, okay. Dude. I thought, dude, I was, I thought, I, I thought I had sniped something because I saw you had a great post, uh, a Stallone Ivan Drago post on your uh, Instagram. You did have a good I one. I thought I he had, did. I thought I had that. Hey, dude, I, I'm a, I'm a fan. I, I'm a, dude, I'm a giant fucking fan of Rocky and like just uh, all, most of Stallone's characters. I just like Burt Reynolds, man. I think that guy was a, uh, He's from a different different time, man. He was a. Uh, <laughs> he, he laid it down like <laughs> not many people did. <laughs> but I'll in a fight, you. in a fight though. Well, we're just talking I mean, a general man. It's just, it's, just, it's just a cocksmith succeeding at life. Dude, I'm I'm working towards this. Is going to be my effort towards working to get Stallone on here. You can try, yeah. Bert. So I mean, I can't. We do can't anything. have Bert. I can't do anything no. with Bert. Yeah, sure shit can't have him. So ultimately, <laughs> Stallone won. Dude, absolutely <laughs> fucking amazing. Yeah, it's blast, man. You've got to come out here and do this shit in person. I, I would love to, man. You let me know when there's a good chance. And I, I, I want my plan was to be there. I really wanted to be there today because, I mean, this you guys sound like a hell of a fun crew. And uh, again, I'm really glad we met, and I'm glad we had a <laughs> glad we had a good time, man. Yeah, what's your sure. What's your personal Instagram and what son's Instagram? Uh, Sons of Liberty GW is our company page, and you have to type it completely in. I mean, we're shadow bandits, so Sons of Liberty GW, you have to go all the way. Then mine is Mike Maholsky, all one word, M I K E, M I H A L S K I. That's my personal. You got to type it all. The I don't way know in. if I'm as banned. You got to find it. If you want to find the cool shit, you got to type it all the way in. You can't just think yeah. it's going to show up. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Hey, dude, hell of a good time. Mike, yep, fucking awesome. It. We're going to do this in person again before the end of 2024. Yeah. If you don't come out here, we're coming to see you. Yeah. I think that'd be cool to go check out the facilities yeah. that you guys do. We should do that. Yeah. We've been getting on the road a little bit. So maybe we we'll should put come out together. and see you. You have a, you have an open invite, man. And we are, we are actually getting a podcast started. We've, we've, oh, we've yeah. kind of sporadically done it and we're starting to do it more and more, uh, like consistently. And like guys, y'all have a permanent invite. Well, thanks dude. Whenever you're ready, let's do it. Appreciate it, Mike. Hey guys. Thanks Mike. Thank Take you. Care, Thank you. Big thanks again to Mike Mahalski, Sons of Liberty Gunworks. If you're looking for a rifle, I don't. I think we've pretty much settled it. Other nobody el- nobody else wins. to go to. Oh no, yeah, yeah. awesome stuff, man. Uh, outside of that, can you just do me a favor? You you control the internet. You can bring it up over here. Yeah, I want you to go uh, r- uh, Rambo First Blood picture. <laughs> okay, and then just uh, pull up the crazy. first the first picture that comes up when you just. Uh, Google whatever the fuck his name is. I can't do it. His name's Bert. Bert. Yeah, Bert. Yeah, it's not a strong name. Throw it up there. Put them side by side. Let's just uh, see what we got. I just Bert Reynolds. Okay, open it up. That's one window. 
Images. Okay. Yeah. Images. Okay, that's the first. Okay, hold that up there. Yep. Spin it over to this monitor, will you? And then just uh, go. Sylvester Stallone. And I want you to take it one step further and put first blood next to it. <coughs> you got to spell it right first. Autocorrect. Yeah. Oh, you're going to go. Oh, even that's fine. Okay. But I'd like, I'd still like you to type in first blood. First if blood. If you wouldn't mind. You want me to type in first blood? Yeah. Picture, uh, yeah, second one from the right. Yeah, if you yeah, would just... Yeah, that one right there. That one right, over right there. New. That one works. No, yeah, not that's Chris, first blood. No, that's not Chris Patzer. Yeah, yeah, not Chris Patzer. <laughs> <laughs> I need you to go one, oh, one more to the right, if you would, please. Okay. All right. Uh, go ahead, close that window. All right. This? Yes. Right there. Yeah. Okay. Hold okay. There. So, cool. Yeah. So he's got a prop gun. That's cool. Uh, no. Put that Burt Reynolds picture. Right. Yeah. That looks like a used yeah. car salesman. Yeah, you're right. Just like a used car salesman. That's the dude that has no worries in the world. And then that's the dude that's playing the movie. Let's play dress up. They're both in movies. Let's, dude. Play, <laughs> let's play dress up and shoot a bang bang guy. That's a belt filled what what M fourteen? What is it? Yeah. M sixteen? Yeah. It's a movie prop. There's a whole nother movie based on is Get that, Me the hey, Gun of Rambo. Is that arm a movie prop? His arms, those movie props? <laughs> <laughs> they, did, they, did they just stick those on him for the movie? Uh, I don't think so. This is still going on. How about this whiskey? This, Rare this, perfection. This was a first. This was an oil and whiskey first this evening. It's the first tonight that I might have an accident on air. I've got to use the restroom did you? so bad. Okay. But you want to... We'll, no, we'll keep okay. it up. Okay. Rare Perfection, 15 year. Why don't you read that whole label for us? Cask Strength, 15 year, 119.7. And then. Uh, what all does it say on the yeah. front? That's like a super amount of text right there. All kinds of text. So I, I'm interested to learn about it. You're usually the one who share this kind of knowledge. God. Start at the top, finish at the bottom. Privilege to have. It's, and that's hard to read. Yeah. Privilege to have. Uh, that's enough of yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> We've been uh, been running out of whiskey actually because uh, Garfield's Beverage Warehouse and Liquor Emporium. A little dry. A little dry it's, lately. It's not <laughs> infused the bourbon bottles lately, unfortunately. So we stopped at a liquor store today and picked this up. It was something in the glass case. We've sampled something in the Rare Perfection lineup once before. Yep. Have we? Here? No, we it was at, uh, at Spears. Okay. Spears is a bourbon bar. Yep. So it looked familiar, looked good. It's uh, 119 proof. I don't think we looked to see that it was cask strength. But that's, I would say that that's probably the hottest bourbon that we have poured on this Yeah, podcast. it was like Booker's level. Yeah. It's rocket hot, fuel. Hot, hot. So fortunately, Phil had some crutches downstairs oh, in the uh, freezer. Some training wheels yeah. in the freezer. But <laughs> so we, th- we threw it. It was it, fairly brutal right out of the gate. But this is one of the few that I would say you, on ice. It's pretty phenomenal. I really liked it yeah. uh, on ice. There's So there's a time and a place for ice to put it on the rocks, put it on a big cube. And that that's the place right there. Yeah. I would have probably not finished it i would have rated it very poorly <clears throat> but yeah, nice. i don't think i could have taken a second drink straight from yeah. the bottle that was that was hot and today on was a different day i'm gonna i'm gonna hit that with a seven four holy on, I, shit i actually quite like so, it yeah. yeah once you i was a big fan i'm gonna go uh seven five like the even number nice dramatic seven, pause six. seven Ooh. seven everybody likes it yeah, that's a, a winner. Good yep, it's good. It's really good. On ice. Yeah. So, did you like it straight? It was, you like it the was higher good. proof. It was a little hot today, yeah. but today was a fucked up day with plane travel and. I, I think it's one. I think it's one to revisit. And we definitely should revisit yeah. the rare perfection. But that's a fucking buy it for sure. Probably a hard one to get your hands on. 
It's out there. $95 bottle, $99 bottle. Not a cheap bottle, but nothing fucking crazy. Yeah, it's good shit. Good shit. Big thanks again to Mike, Sons of Liberty Gunworks. Mike Mahalski on Instagram, Sons of Liberty Gunworks on Instagram. Find a buy a trigger kit, buy a rail, buy a upper, lower, buy a barrel, buy whatever. Thanks for listening to Oil and Whiskey with the Roach Shop and Ironclad Original. If you like the show, just you know, are we contractually like required to say that at the end? No, I just read it. Okay. If you well, know what, part of it. you don't have to do anything. Just listen again next week, and we're good. I like that better. See you again next week.